Hello, hello everyone. Hello, welcome Friday. The last Friday we'll be doing this and I'm so glad to see everybody here. It's a nice way to close out the week and the year. I'm passing out some mics now, but welcome to everybody. Thank you so much. Hello, Mike. Um, I appreciate you coming by from Remix to tell us about some new developments and new things that are happening. Um, working on getting you a mic there, I'm sorry. <laughs> but welcome. We, we're gonna talk today about um, some of the things that affected us the most and some of the things that, that had the biggest impact on us over the last year uh, related to generative AI. But welcome everybody. I'm sorry, I have somebody making noise right outside my uh, room here, Sama. So um, Rob or Sama, would you like to say hello? Why? <laughs> it's hello everyone, welcome, happy Friday. Super excited for this week's generative AI Friday. And um, we're doing a quick recap on um, the latest development and also just throughout the whole year and um, what's been happening. Um, so yeah, it's, it's gonna be an exciting one today. Welcome everyone, happy Friday. One of the craziest things I think is to realize how much has happened, especially in the last, like, like I, you know, we just crossed the one year anniversary of chat GPT, like, um, what, two, three weeks ago, you know, this, it feels like the entire professional world has changed in a year and, and that it couldn't have possibly been just one year ago that uh, the momentum and the speed of change started picking up. And so, yeah, it's relentless. And that's why we come by every Friday to talk about these things. Um, but I'm super looking forward to like kind of revisiting some of the best moments of 2023 and uh, just kind of remarking on, you know, how how things have transformed for all of us. I agree, too, because I just noticed that um, one year ago um, tomorrow was the first time I wrote about chat GBT. And I wrote like it was the first viral thread I had. And I you know, 11 things you can do about chat GPT and just trying to come up with just to tell people the use that we have here right now, like what we can do with it. So I just wanted to say you can write red books, do CTA, you can translate, whatever. And um, it's crazy how much that changed since then and how much it's been in our lives. So I'm, I'm excited because that kind of catapulted me into this intergenerative completely. And um, it kind of falls into image generation and video and everything else. So I'm excited to talk about it. And I thank everybody for your time. I appreciate you guys coming. And on that sound there, hello. We're here together. And we're going to go over what this last year's podcast like for us and what the biggest impacts were. But first, I'm Mike Dougherty here from Remix, and I appreciate it if you could just give us an idea of what's happening right now, because all kind of cool features are dropping, and um, it's a lot of fun. So, welcome, Mike, and hey, you want to tell us what's going on in today. Thanks, Heather. I, it's, thanks for inviting me. Go ahead. Me I'm sorry. And, welcome. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Can you guys hear me? Am I am I coming up? Come through? Okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and thank you again. And also at the at the you know space of the wrapping up the year, it's sort of special to be on that. But um, and by the way, I agree with Rob that uh, it's hard to kind of get your head around the year where you, you have 150 plus million people using ChatGPT. It's only one year old, and I can't hear Mike. Can anybody else hear? Is it maybe that's just me? Oops. Wait. Or I'm hearing him just fine. And Heather, you were breaking up a little bit. I'm wondering if you're experiencing the famous, uh, you know, X reliability. Okay. Mike, Mike, you sound good. So I would say keep okay. going. Okay. Okay. Yeah, let me know. And I'll try to um, monitor from, I'm still on my phone, but thank you. I apologize. Please go ahead. Well, Rob, and Rob, just to your point, though, I was just going to say that I, I don't know the exact number of people who have done image generation at this point, but if you have 150 million people who have tried some form of text generation, whether it's style of term paper or style of program my computer, you know, pro make a application, you know, or whatever, you have 
15, 20 million people have probably tried image generation and probably like a subset of that have used video. So it's still very early and yet it's moving so rapidly. And so I think that's just the fascinating moment we have with AI where it's rapid and radical and sort of what is happening around us. And yet um, it's still pretty new related to when you think about billions of people and whether they've tried prompting or really access this technology. So it'll be a very interesting next 12 months, I'm guessing. But um, in any case, we're really excited uh, to end the year strong. We've, we've got a couple of things that we released on Remix. Um, and for those who uh, aren't familiar with Remix, we're a, a, a mobile app on iOS and Android uh, available in the, for free, but really a social mobile app. So we're we look at the world sort of from the lens of if you combined a social app with AI or AI creation, how would you rethink how TikTok or Instagram would work? And so um, some people ask us, you know, would, would you launch on desktop? And the answer is yes, but we did start with mobile. And uh, w one of the things or one of the two things we launched this week that are related to mobile in, in some ways um, uh, re are a feature we launched that was sort of the next uh, generation of image to image on our platform. So on Remix, you can share any image that you create with Midjourney or Firefly or uh, any generative engine. You just uh, you can post that image onto our feed and other people can see it and they can learn from you by doing so. But we also have our own sort of filters, we call them on our platform that sort of reminded us a little bit of Instagram and how you could make, you know, take your take your photographs on any camera and you could use Photoshop or whatever to continue to um, edit them or add styles. But Instagram also launched with filters so they could allow it for people who wanted to just a, a, a fast and easy way of using it. And so we did the same thing with Remix, where in addition to posting um, images or videos that you're making with other tools, you can also use some of the tools that we um, built in the app. And this week we launched uh, a, a upgraded version of image to image and something that we are just calling filters. And so I'll just explain what the both of them are and sort of what I'm having a lot of fun using them for. So um, the idea is you're on your phone. The idea is your phone is a camera phone, of course. We all know that for since mobile was the last big uh, technology trend that really changed our lives. I think trillions of digital photos have been taken. Many of them are on our phones. So now with our upgraded image to image, any image that you have on your phone, whether it's a picture you've taken, a selfie, although it does not just limited to selfies, any, any image that you have, you can now use our upgraded image to image to really do amazing things with. We're adding a new layer of, let's call it control, where the generation can be shaped around that image in ways that are just really cool. And um, uh, there's a slider on it where you can go from lowest to highest and lowest is where there's the most power that the prompt has over that image. And highest is where it's the lightest touch that the prompt will have on the image. But with that control, you can really have fun with images of all types. And I think it will really unlock the creativity of some of the folks who are using Remix. So we're really excited about that upgraded image to image. Um, and then the second thing that we released is filters, which leverages that core technology under the hood. But it's just an easy way to have a fun a way to just tap a filter, almost like an AI filter on Instagram, except this is Remix. You can tap this, add a photo uh, or a selfie, and apply that style to that image and make, make something fun out of it. And we're going to have a lot of fun with filters. Uh, Starting next week, we're going to start adding even more filters from the community. So we're um, really looking forward to seeing what the the community would suggest and create related to filters, because we think it'd be a lot of fun if we unleash all of your creativity and and see where it goes. Just I think our goal with filters is to see if we could have the funnest set of filters that you'd want to try in a tray uh, against images you might create. So. Um, those are the two features we, the last time I was on, I think we had released, um, another feature called loops, which is a, a short two second video loop feature. That's also fun. Um, that one took off as a huge hit. We had about 3000% gross of a video on remix since we launched that two weeks ago. Um, 
and then people are just generating a lot in general. We have, I think we had about a million generations after the first 60 days um, that I mentioned on, on the spaces a couple of weeks ago. And since that, in the last two weeks, we have about 2.5 million. So we have, we've uh, grown about 150% in about two weeks. So a lot of cool stuff, a lot of amazing creativity and uh, just really fun to see what the community is doing with these. So we're excited to kind of push these new capabilities out right before the holidays to see if people want to have fun when they're, when they have some downtime. You guys are really pushing these features out fast, Mike. And given that you're scaling this quickly as well, and I, uh, having worked in software companies before, like going from a million to two and a half million, it's not as like easy as it sounds, right? So kudos to the team on that. Um, and I also want to commend you on the image to image uh, feature because, like, as a pretty big Mid Journey user, I like I love prompting with images. But on Mid Journey, like, you have to upload the image. And then like wait for it to appear and then you like click on it and like right click and get the URL and then go back and turn on an imagine, you know, like imagine and then paste. It. It's like, it's so much and um, it's, it's pretty annoying. And then to adjust the weight of the image for the rest of the prompt again, now we're like using little more text and adding things and it's a pain and it's, it's just really nice on remix um, to be able to do that. And, and, I find that I'm actually prompting with images a lot more because of how smooth it is. Um, nice. Thing I wanted to ask you is, so that's really like a, a Discord flow. And I do find though, it, even with Remix, and Remix is, is fun, but is are there any plans for Discord? Like, how are we thinking about that? That does seem like it's my yeah. habit to go to Discord and play with Mid Journey. Um, what's your point of view on that? Um, it's a great point. I think when we, when we built Remix and designed it, as it's obvious, we thought mobile first. And so we were thinking, wouldn't it be nice to bring a really easy to use mobile experience to as many people as possible, especially since mobile is so big, you know, globally with most applications. Um, but, you know, when you think about the AI enthusiast community, AI creators, Discord was the starting point for, for various reasons, um, including Midjourney and where they started. So. If you think about it, it's sort of crazy for us to be launching like where people aren't. <laughs> if if they're on Discord, you should launch on Discord, which I think a lot of uh, other tools, apps, et cetera, have done launching on Discord. So um, you might say, well, that wasn't very smart. But but we, we actually believe that Remix is a social kind of experience and that it would make sense to be mobile. That said, there's a lot of people on Discord that basically use Midjourney and all sorts of things. And we think if we could bring that social experience into Discord so that you could kind of integrate more easily right there, especially for people who are using it and using desktop so much, that that would make sense. So we're looking pretty hard at that. Um, maybe some kind of cool way to integrate to Discord that feels very Remix, but, but, but could be done on Discord. So um, we're looking at that. Um, and just back to your other point, though, on using image to image, what I find that I am totally making more with image to image. Mm -hmm. Like, it's super fun because you can take, it's not just photos, you can take a mid journey image. <laughs> so I took a mid journey image. Right. You know? right. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, right. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. Just anything. Uh, you could, all yeah, the you time. You have a starting point and then you can kind of riff with it. And, I like I made some image that I had with some prompt that was a prequel cool prompt and it was on mid journey. And then I just used it on our platform with image to image and made it into sort of like a figurine that looked like Barbie. So there's just a lot of little fun things you can do. If you think about things more like the image is the control point, it's the starting point of a composition and you can kind of go with, you can riffle with it from there. Yeah, if you're just joining us, um, welcome to the Generative AI Friday recap. We're talking with Mike over at Remix. Um, Remix is an app, if you if you haven't used it, and, and don't jump into it immediately right now because it'll actually cut you off <laughs> from the Twitter space, but um, definitely get on there. It's, it's To me, it's a lot like, you know, when we do these community posts here on X and somebody will share a prompt and share some images, and then people will start to riff in the comments on, and like, here's my version of this, or here's this as a butterfly, or, you know, 
whatever it is. It's really an app that's kind of built to create those kinds of magical moments, but also make it way easier for you to create and generate images like right there in the app. So instead of having to jump between social media and your image platform and back and forth, you do it all in Remix and it, it's quite addictive. So a fair warning, once you get in there, uh, make sure you've got a few minutes ahead of you. But Mike, Mike really, you know, Kudos on this. I think that we as the generative AI art community are now finding a home in the app that you've created. And, you know, this is, it's something that uh, I think that we we all needed a place that was better than just sort of Instagram or X or something that's that wasn't quite designed to be AI first and, and sort of creativity first. So absolutely loving it. Um, as we look forward to 2024, like I know you guys hustled to get some of these awesome features out these holidays. Uh, well, first of all, any other cool holiday sneak peeks or gifts that we should be aware of? And then what's what's in, in it for the future? Like where are you headed with this? Yeah, so um, we're going to just keep going through the, the holidays. So I think that the beginning of the year is going to be busy. Um, first, I hope everyone has fun over the holidays. And I personally use this as a pastime like as something that's a fun hobby and um you know i'm just assuming everyone will have more fun with all these new technologies that have been released pika et cetera, et cetera, just all these fun new things that we can play with but um what's coming next for us is certainly we are looking at online and discord we think that the we heard um, clearly from everybody that desktop would be an important place for us so um no timing on that to share yet, but we are looking at that. And then exciting for me though, um, and I think we, we want Remix to be fun. It's not just a tool. There's plenty of tools out there to make things. Um, and so fun can also mean doing it with friends or doing it with others um, where they kind of inspire you, or maybe it's a little bit even like, not like a game, but something where you're kind of riffing off of each other. And so Remix was built with a feature called Remix that's like that but there's more we could do with that to make it a little bit more structured and perhaps easier to have fun with your friends. So we're gonna look at things like that. And we're also going to, um, we got an idea of a couple of new things to release in the beginning of the year that I'm really blown away by and excited. And I think it would be really, they're, they're social in nature, they're AI at the core. And um, when they're ready, I'd, I'd be excited to share it with everybody. <clears throat> Yeah, well, like, I'm almost picturing, and here, let me influence your roadmap a little bit. Do you ever play like Jackbox games or anything like that, <laughs> where it's like a bunch of people hanging out on the couch with their phones? Like, I could just see some in some way it to be so fun to be kind of hanging out, you know, like competing to try and make the funniest thing with a prompt or just doing stuff in, in that more collaborative way. I, I, I love I love that you guys are are trying to figure out stuff like that, and totally. Uh, maybe one day we'll be able to live stream it on on X here <laughs> for the space, um, and all of us can play along. Totally, Rob. That's that's literally like the direction that I love what you said about Jackbox games. Uh, we seem to get a lot of the um, what is it, Mad Libs? Everyone's like, oh, you should make Mad Libs, you know. So um, those types of fun, simple, collaborative games. I think we, look, we're not going to be a game app, but at the same time, having some fun would be something in our future so yeah well awesome mike thanks so much for for joining us for you know being a supporter of this this space this segment and um just again for carrying the torch for the gen ai community and the art community and um and building this with us all right heather uh who <laughs> has been having audio issues but Hey Heather, um, how are we doing? Uh, you want to try and talk, see see if we're reconnected, or do I need to keep going here? All right, I I hear no Heather, so I Whoa, am going wait, to. Can you hear me? Oh, there I you are. Hear you. I can hear you now. Yay! But it's probably going to go out in a few seconds, so I'm sorry, everybody, but thank you so much, Mike, for coming up, and I was able to listen a little bit on my desktop, but I just wanted to start, you know, talk kind of talking about the, the biggest issues. The biggest, the biggest impacts on all of us. So you started talking about ta uh, Chat GPT, Rob, because I think it seems like that was my my impetus. So I wanted to get feedback on you guys on like how has it changed how you do how you do your everyday or your content creation. And Taylor, I know you do have a list of several things. And before I go out, I'll just mention uh, a few that I had 
thought about. And it just kind of completely changed the way it accelerated, like how I research content, come up with ideas, brainstorming, um, just, you know, different. It simplified a lot of things for me that were like the headaches where writing, t you know, coming up with titles or intros for a, a blog article or a thread, um, CTAs, call to actions, those little things like that. It just sped it up so much quicker and gave me multiple ideas. It, SEO, coming up with SEO titles and descriptions, that was that's still a headache, but it's something that is much easier now and you can get feedback right away. But that, and then also it broadened my audience because of the ability to translate. So now I could translate what people were asking or saying to me. If, it, if they like retweeted or reposted uh, something that I wrote, I could see what exactly they said and I asked what, where was that language from? And could you give me another reply to me, give me a reply in the style of that speaker. So when I would reply to them, I wanted to do that. And then I also told them this was from ChatGPT or from Jasper or whatever. And I think I just wanted to show them how they could use it too. So those are some of the things that helped me and it just kind of changed everything. And now it even moved into image generation because developing prompts and researching styles and artists and you know movements, genres, it has just kind of changed everything where this wouldn't have been possible before. But Taylor, I know you had a list of different things and how um, yeah, and it's impacted. I Totally. Can you hear me okay, Heather? I can now. I'm not sure. I'll just I'll keep my fingers crossed. No, we're all rugged here on the spaces today. Um, and I don't even have to go yet. I just wanted to make a mention of like it would be really cool if we could I've got a toddler in the, in the vicinity, but it would be really cool if we could also like recap some of our first experiences with AI as well. Cause I was having this conversation earlier this week that like I remember literally the first time that I ever used an AI tool and it was back in 2020 and um, I was just blown away. It was like GPT-3 or something like copy AI. And then there was like Jarvis or Jasper or whatever you call it. Um, and I was mind blown. So just, just curious if we could keep some of those in mind too, because um, that was like a big turning point for me. But I guess also while I'm, while I'm on the mic, I'll just say like the big things for me as a creator, marketer, content strategist, business entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it, like the big, big updates have for me have been in just the massive improvements we've seen in text and image generation. Um, it went from the beginning of this year to like, eh, yeah, there's some really cool stuff that we can do with this to now it's just like absolutely insane, the level of competency and creativity and, um, just effectiveness I get from it every time, both on the intricacy and beauty of these like images and the, the accuracy, attention to detail. Um, but then on the text side of it, you know, things that I never thought were possible, I'm, I'm able to do now. And so some of the quick things that I use it for, I did put together like a quick list, but I'm not going to go through all of it, but like copy for landing pages and thumbnails for featured images and stories, you know, stock imagery, stock video, even at that. Um, things like social content creation, although I could advocate against that in some respects as well. Maybe we could get into it a little bit, Rob. Um, you know, ad copy, scripting, any sort of script writing, uh, product descriptions, SEO you mentioned already. That's also a big one for me, Heather. Um, so just these little menial tasks that, you know, as somebody who's running a business, who's marketing, who's creating content, it's just been a huge lift um, to be able to have what feels like the support of of an executive assistant, but in an AI uh, format, an AI multi multimodal format, even at that, and it's just been it's been pretty life changing this year. I can point to this year being the year that like things really changed. I think um, in the way that I work in my career. So that's all. Can I, let me see some emojis. Um... If you have ChatGPT or another AI tab open all the time, like I have my email tab always open. If you have ChatGPT open, let me see anybody here on the call. I see a, a lot of 100s, right? Like this has become like a, an institution. Or I, I mean, I don't know if that's the right use of that word, but it really has become like 
one of those few things that everybody now is sort of having all the time that tool right next to each other. Quite, quite amazing. Um, Taylor, I'm, I'm going to be distracted for a second. I'm trying to find some of the original writing tests that I did when I was playing with GPT-2 like three, four years ago. Like they're hilariously bad. And so- Oh, they're so um... bad. So vividly, <laughs> when I asked it what an NFT was, and it said an NFT is a nail fungus toe. And then that was it. And I was like, I mean, okay, yes. <laughs> basically as valuable as I'm um, no, no, just kidding. <laughs> oh, that that's too much. As a pharmacist, that's too funny. But <laughs> yeah, it's changed a lot. It's been because I used to use Jasper before uh, ChatGPT came out and it was OK. You know, it was helpful. It seemed like it was amazing at the time that it was doing that well. But um, it, everything changed with, after that. So um, I do appreciate the, um, that we had uh, with the, all these things here. And it's just, I, it's, I can't imagine not having it at this point. And it hasn't even been that long. Uh, it just seems like it would make, everything would be so different without it. What about you, AP? Are you available? Are you, can you speak? I know um, you can only be with us for a little while. How's it? Yeah, how's it going? Hey. Yeah, I think for me, um, like the most impactful thing has definitely been like the release of Stable Diffusion. Um, I think it's been a little over a year now since like 1.5 or 1.4 dropped. And like since then, it's just been like, it's been crazy, like, you know, to have mid journey, right, but like open sourced, where like you can then train your own models in any style, you know, Dream Booth came out. Where like now people were creating models in like different styles, doing like Pixar, all this different stuff. Like the innovation that spawned from that was like insane. Like so many startups are using Stable Diffusion now. Uh, you know, we had control nets come out that allowed us to maintain the form and reimagine like images, do all these crazy things. You know, now they're using it in like VFX, um, doing like panoramas, 360 panoramas, like equal rectangular images that make those 360 stuff like. Yeah, so many different things. Um, and it's just like continuing to get exciting, more and more exciting. Like now I think animation and like video is starting to pick up, but it's like building upon like some of the same things. And then now it's like you get some of that stuff like real time with like consistency models, uh, you know, building upon like, you know, the whole like stable diffusion community. Um, but yeah, like for me, it, it's just been such a dope thing. Um, and then again, the fact that it's open source, like the community is just building on it. We had so many different like viral trends this year. Um, Illusion Diffusion was one of them. You know, people making memes, just spreading them out. Yeah, it's just been a crazy, crazy year. And I, I think next year is just going to be more exciting. Allie, what about you? Well, as one of the chat GPT always open <laughs> people in this space, um, that has certainly been the go-to this year. And also I used the same Jaspers and played with those. I, I did a lot of content writing and have been over the last 20 years in various for shapes and forms. And as a SEO um, veteran, as that has been a huge part of uh, a huge focus of my business for the last 20 years. Um, you know, it's always you're playing with new tools to figure out what you can do. Can you streamline content, what you can do? And and just before I forget, just a caution from the SEO things as you use it. If you use it straight from the oven, from ChatGPT, it may not be really good. So just a word of warning or caution um, as a, you know, I'm testing it constantly, not recently because I've been too busy doing other things, but it isn't necessarily great, but it can be good or better than if you didn't have any SEO. So just keep that in mind if you do not have any SEO experience, um, you know, in general. Um, that's something that I noticed. So also now that it's closer to the actual, you know, real time information, it's better. But if you think about just in general, having information from a year ago or even six months ago, it's different than what it is right now. Oh, it's also the same thing, even if you ask for, you know, hooks for Twitter without anything or 
you know, anything like that, it's going to still, or X, it's still going to give you a lot of emojis and a lot of hashtags. And at the end of the day, does somebody still use hashtags? <laughs> I don't. And I think that that has already been proven also that it really isn't that effective. And who knows if that even goes away. So just those things to keep in mind. And I, I you know, looking back a little bit, reflecting, I remember how I felt so overwhelmed and I felt like I was walking around and just going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, even a year ago, felt like I needed to be breathing in a bag <laughs> because things were moving so fast and my brain wasn't able to absorb all of it when we really got into the things are moving quickly. And I was just thinking that if this is how it's going to go continue, I don't know how I'm going to keep up because my poor little brain is not going to be able to manage it. But luckily, it's settled down. And certainly, we've still packed a lot of stuff in this last year, but it seems more manageable. And although, you know, things are happening every single day, there's so many new developments that you know, we certainly have a lot of um, exciting things moving forward. And again, not to hog the mic here, one last thing I can chime in on other things later on too, but looking for the future, I feel this year still has been um, exploration more so, and I definitely focused on the chat GPT and or the chat bots and then the image generation and mid journey has been my most important thing. I wanted to pick two things that I could really go in deeper and learn more instead of trying every single little thing because I felt like I just would be too scattered. Um, so that has been my focus. But moving forward, I am looking at more things um, and just seeing getting moving forward or past this exploration stage and then actually now seeing, OK, how are we going to use this? How are we going to apply them into business or into, you know, more effectively, I guess I should say, instead of just in this exploration. And although I love the creative exploration as well and just being the kind of the researcher nerd type of person, because I love that. But OK, now how do these pieces fit in? And I know that Rob is already leading in this space where you are putting those pieces together. And I'm just um, looking at it from the OK, for general folks, we, we have like, for example, stable diffusion is still very hard for many people because it's not as easy and user friendly. And the user interface and user experience is not like with, you know, OpenAI's chat GPT, which I think is one of the big reasons why it is so popular, because they've made it so easy for us to basically have it as part of our lives right now. Well said, Ali. Uh, well said. I mean, this to me one of the, one of the most remarkable moments this year was starting the year with ChatGPT 3.5, and it was already quite amazing in terms of the capability compared to other things. And then when GPT 4 came out, taking those exact same prompts and dropping them in, and seeing what happens when you try this with a more capable model. And I actually just did this again where I went through and I tried a bunch of prompts from like March with the with the new GPT-4 Turbo, which is arguably actually a pretty decent upgrade from the original GPT-4, um, you know, from, from earlier this year. And, and just to see the evolution of this technology, like right there, side by side for, for a sort of half a version. Um, really cool. The other big moment for me this year was um, it was it was the image to video and the text to video stuff, and just watching creations sort of come alive before our eyes and start to move. And um, you know, even even though they were imperfect and often sort of doing <laughs> strange things, I, I mean, I think we all probably or many 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 of us on this call. Uh, experienced that where we were just like, I have to do more. Like, I want to generate more. I want to see what happens. And this like kind of unlocking of magic. And it really is in a way, it makes me feel like a kid again, being an, an adult in this moment, because it's like magic exists all of a sudden again. Like it's real. It's around us. Like like the the ability to create and for for serendipity to happen and unexpected things and to combine things together. Like this is what 
our imaginations did when we, you know, we'd play, um, I played a lot of like role playing games and stuff when I was a kid, or whatever. But like, you know, it, it really does take me back to this kind of that world of imagination play. But but now we're sort of doing it for real, and I I don't know, I can't I can't get enough of it, and that's why here we are, <laughs> here I am in this space, right? Well, I'm so glad that you were here in this space, Rob, because you kind of helped um, shepherd us into uh, how we could work with ChatGPT. <laughs> like, what do we do with it? What else can we do with it? And how do you talk to this thing? and um, learning how to just kind of put together a prompt that made sense and working on that. So it also, you ch um, you know warned us about how stimulating it is to work with this stuff, the generative AI, and how it can really wear you down. Because you got sick last year, right? Just trying to get um, you know your first course out there. But it is, it's kind of like you can just kind of go 24 hours with it and not realize that all that time passed. How yeah, do you I think Oh, I was gonna say, I think there's actually, there's a new set of skills that we are all in the process of developing that we've never really had before when it comes to AI. One of them is the, like, it's kind of a new dopamine addiction where, because you can sort of put anything in and hit the magic button and something comes out. It's just, we can, we can just get addicted to the act of creation. And I think it's fine. And um, like, I actually refer to it as art therapy and stuff to do that sometimes where it's relaxing and it's nice. Um, but there's this other part where we try and do something like for a business case. And then we start kind of over prompting and um, like going down rabbit holes that we don't need to and forgetting like, why am I even here doing this work? Like, what am I actually trying to do? Create some content or a strategy or write up a contract for my new partnership or like whatever it is. And without the, without any kind of normal container around that work, it's easy to go and lose like two hours because you just kind of went down the path. The, the other one, so, so, oh, so there's that discipline. It's like you have this really high dopamine effect of being a god and being able to create just by putting in words and images. And, and now we have to self-limit ourselves. But the other thing that, that I've seen that people need to develop is this ability to cut and to, to discard and to, to judge things kind of relatively quickly. And um, in a way, like our generations remind me of when I first got a, a, a phone with a camera on it. And maybe you guys had this too, or maybe, no, it wasn't the first one because the first camera sucked, but like my first iPhone, I would take like 600 pictures a day somehow. And none of them had value because I was just like taking pictures of everything. And you take like 30 pictures of one thing because I no longer have film to pay for to develop those images. I can just basically take as many as I want. But we're all basically doing that right now with AI um, quite a bit where we can generate so much that it almost loses meaning. And it's almost impossible to find, like, where's the actual good photo in that pile of 600, the one that I want to save? And even I, like, find that a lot of times uh, the the projects that I've worked on, I know, like, I've lost good stuff because, like, I overgenerated. I kind of couldn't keep up with it all. I, like, picked out a couple of things that I was going to use and discarded the rest. And it's actually really fun, like, to go back through my mid-journey um, history or my stable diffusion folder or, like, really scroll, 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 like, um, and look at stuff. And I'm like, hey, this is really good. Like, why didn't I ever do anything with this? So these are, like, the new skills of... Of, of our new AI era. And I don't think that people are kind of ready for this type of surplus of, of creativity and of creation. Um, so it's definitely something that I think that the world is gonna need to adapt to. And I, I can almost see like a new movement um, turning up in 2024, sort of the Marie Kondo of AI, where it's like, how do we, uh, how do we figure out how to like kind of cleanse our, our digital homes and get them organized and, and have the things that we appreciate around us um, and how do we how do we sort of you know thank and let go the the other generations that we've had that are no longer serving us? Yeah, that's a good point. We'll have cottage industries coming up just to organize that, and we kind of have it a little bit with the different co-pilots and um, just having the AI in, within in all of our different uh, apps. And with uh, while we're going throughout the day, I was thinking about like Notion and within Google and Microsoft. So it'll be interesting. Um, Salma, did you say what you were thinking about um, the thing that impacted you the most? I don't know if I missed you if, if you went already. No, definitely. So um, as everyone else touched on, ChatGPT um, has been the biggest one for me. Just the ability to... Um, basically train it with my style of writing um, put for either blog posts, emails, things like that. And I think the biggest um, AI moment as well was Midjourney when they released their version five. 
their images were, I felt like, good enough to use in a meaningful way. Um, and as a creative, as someone that tries to put together creative workflow, I felt like mid-journey, stable diffusion, especially with like mid-journeys in painting and describe feature was really like one of the biggest moments for, for me personally. And as a person that creates a lot of sort of images, background images and works with different brands, piecing together creative workflows, I think mid-journey and then also stable diffusion, the fact that it's open source and you can um, train up Laura's models so yeah, I think it's been a it's been a quite a year this year. Um, so I would say those are my top three um, AI tools I use on a daily basis, and I'm really excited to see what's up next. I am dabbling quite a lot with video, so text to video. I know like Runway has had like a significant improvement when it comes to their like um, videos. The aesthetic quality is just insane. Um, but yeah, like. Like, like everyone else mentioned, really like my top three is basically chat GPT and then the image generation models. Do you, have you been using, um, did you find that you use chat GPT in different uh, LLMs to help you with developing prompts for your images and also for your business? Yeah, um, well, chat GPT, I keep it quite simple and I have like a few prompts that I like re reuse a few times. Um, but now I have been dabbling quite a, a bit with generating. Um, so the new workflow that I've been using recently is to ask um, ChatGPT to give me prompts based on like a brand description. So I'll give it the description, say, for example, a soda can um, that has an aesthetic of um, the vibe is like Gen X or something like that. And then I'll ask it to describe a like a, uh, scene and then I'll ask Dali to generate the initial scene and then I'll throw that into mid journey and I've been getting so the prompt so I'd throw the prompt into mid journey the image and then I would get like really nice images good enough to use and I feel like that workflow is beginner friendly and it does speed up a lot of things so that's how I've been using chat GPT to um, basically to create images um again like like i said it's something new new that i've been trying out and it's been working quite good whereas before i'd have to like put together a bunch of prompts save them on a notion document and then kind of um go through the notion document i feel like someone needs to come come up with some sort of idea where you know you can keep all your mid-journey prompts and everything and it just pulls up everything for you based on i don't know like a description feature um but yeah, I think this new workflow is definitely like beginner friendly. So I'm going to be sharing more information about that. Well, thank you. That sounds promising. Appreciate it. And Matt, you came in. Um, if Oh, did somebody else? Go ahead, Salma. Go ahead. Salma, did you want to finish something? Oh, no, no, no. no. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but Matt, welcome back. Um, we're welcome today. And what what was the biggest impact on you over the past year from for 2023 generative ai yeah it's a it's a good question because <laughs> for me the whole sort of ai space was what was the the big impact for me i've been using gpt3 since you know mid 2021 mostly for you know creative writing and uh, content marketing and and things like that but in 2023, the thing that I think had the biggest impact for me was, I know AP already was mentioning this, was probably Stable Diffusion, because When I came across Stable Diffusion, that was when I really went all in on the, the content creation around AI. I just, 
I fell in love with the ability to generate art with AI and to, you know, merge my face into the AI and create crazy thumbnails for YouTube using AI and, and things like that. So Stable Diffusion was, I mean, I, I started experimenting with Stable Diffusion last year, but it wasn't until this year that the YouTube channel started to take off and I really decided to deep dive in on it and, and learn it more and figure out how to really do some cool stuff with it. So that was the thing that had the biggest impact on me. Um, but overall, I just love the pace of everything. To me, it's been super exciting to just watch everything advance so dang quickly. I remember, you know, nine, ten months ago, uh, text to like 3D objects. We were using things like Point D, where you were getting just like little sort of dot representations of 3D objects. And now you've got things like common sense machines and you've got Genie from Luma where you can actually generate really, really cool looking 3D images from from uh, text prompts and, you know, watching the evolution of nerfs and then gosh and splats. And now we got Smurfs and all of that kind of stuff has been fun to really watch the advancements. And I think Rob was talking about this earlier with the, the video generation stuff you know back towards the beginning of the year back in you know spring of this year we were messing around with like model scope and you were barely even able to tell what the videos were when you were generating them and here we are just you know seven eight months later and we've got pika 1.0 and runway gen 2 that generate just amazing videos now so you know while stable diffusion was probably the thing that really really sucked me down the rabbit hole and also really helped launch my YouTube channel. I'm just in awe of the space and the pace at what everything, uh, you know, that everything's moved at in this space. And just looking back nine months ago of what things looked like then to what they look like now. And I mean, you look at something like mid journey, right back in, um, you know, I, I was using mid journey back in July of last year. And you had to put some pretty complex prompts in there to get the image you wanted. And most of the times they didn't come out very close to what you were looking for. Now I can go and plug in a prompt to mid journey. That's like a picture of a cute cat. And I get like an amazing image. That's just like awesome and perfect. And just what I was looking for. So just the, the fact that prompting has gotten so much easier over the last 12 months. And now you barely even need to try to prompt anything and you get really good images. So, you know, for me, it's, it's just sort of the, the overall space in general and watching the, the pace at how much, how, how fast this has moved. Um, you know, it, it's it's interesting from the perspective of a YouTuber who watches the comments on my YouTube channel, how quickly people take for granted where we were nine months ago, right? How quickly people are like, ah, oh, mid-journey images are crap. They have a long way to go still. It's like, yeah, but did you see where we were nine months ago? Like, this is crazy. So yeah, I mean, that that's sort of my my rant there is I just, I love the space as a whole. There's no like, one specific thing that I feel like changed my life. The thing that changed my life was watching the pace of all of this stuff and the momentum of all of this stuff. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's it kind of like, yeah, that was like a, a stimulus, but then all these other things were happening already. And I think, yeah, it's kind of hard to picture exactly why I, you know, I was already into visual art and just trying to learn how to create visual content and trying to, you know, learn how to prompt a little bit and see what different image generators could do. And then with ChatGPT, it kind of like, it took a while for me to put them together and kind of use them concurrently. But it's, it is funny to think about how people do take it for granted uh, and how much that, um, that we didn't have even a few months ago. And now we do. So prompting and people talking about getting prompt engineering jobs. I wonder, do you all think those types of things are even still viable is it worth even talking about or it would it be where would you direct people to look instead of like worrying about prompt engineering or how to utilize how to integrate prompting or just thinking about it differently in what they yeah, do my, so my thoughts i'm actually curious to hear what rob thinks about this as well but my thoughts on prompt engineering have definitely evolved a few times over the last couple of years um you know I think prompt engineering is still something that will be important to understand if 
you really want to go deep into AI and you're sort of building some of the underlining plumbing. I think the general public, the normal people who are going to places like chat GPT or mid journey or, or things like that to, to just have it help them and assist them with, you know, things that they do in their daily life. I don't think it's a worthwhile pursuit to really learn prompt engineering, but if you're somebody that's trying to develop tools or build SaaS platforms or build, you know, workflows or systems using AI, I still think prompt engineering is going to be important for you because, you know, wh when you look at something like, let's say, chat GPT, and now we have GPTs where you can kind of create the, the, the sort of custom use cases for chat GPT. Well, when you're writing the custom instructions that go underneath, that's where I think the prompt engineering starts to become a little bit more necessary is to, to the, the, the sort of system prompts, the, the, the custom instructions that you're giving. That's where prompt engineering, I think, is still going to be important for a little while. But then the people that are just using the GPTs, the point is to make it as simple as possible for the people using the G GPTs. And the prompt engineer is the person developing the GPTs, if that makes sense. So I think it's important for the people that are sort of creating an AI, but it's not important for most users of AI. That's yeah, a good I think I, oh, go ahead, Rob. Thank you. I think, I think I would agree with a lot about that. Um, it really is with AI, we now, we all can basically be like no code app developers where the code is just language, natural language, right? And so if you want to try to create really sophisticated things with AI, then you, you want to learn prompt engineering because that's kind of the, the, the new code, right? I think you're right in the sense that a, a regular person can get a pretty good result out of AI without, without knowing that. But I do think, and actually I, I, I took it even further this week. Some people say garbage in, garbage out when it comes to AI. Um, and, and I actually took it to, um, average in garbage out, which is to say, I think that it's really, really easy for you to use AI and kind of like not prompt very well. And what you get sort of looks good. And so you don't, you don't even realize that what you get actually isn't very good because on the surface, it kind of does look good and it does look useful. And so I, I do worry for people who are are not prompting in a very sophisticated way and then are, are using those outputs and kind of taking what the AI gives them at face value, it'll like it'll reply in a very assertive and confident way, but that doesn't mean its information is right or good. And I do think that there, there's some prompt engineering things that we can do to get it better. But in, in terms of, Heather, your question about jobs, I don't think that there are very many prompt engineer jobs out there. There's a few like at Anthropic, for example, you can get hired as a prompt librarian, but this is, they're literally having people put together resources to teach people using Claude how to use it better. And um, in a way that's an, it's an educational job. It's a content marketing job. You know, like it, they may call it a prompt librarian because the types of research and content you're creating is all about prompting. But really the job that you have is a, a kind of the same type of job that any semi-technical field might hire for in terms of just teaching people how to better use your tool. So, and um, what I love about Anthropic and uh, you can actually go into their blogs and into their, into their resources and learn a ton. And it's really nicely written and they've spent a lot of time and money to, to do that. In terms of the other prompt engineering type jobs, it's always going to be prompt engineering plus one to three other major skills or disciplines, right? So we're seeing a rise in AI automations agencies. Well, that's it's prompt engineering plus process and, and systems design, you know, plus no code automation. And, um, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of code involved in terms of connecting APIs and things. So th that's like a whole bunch of different skills. It's not just prompting. Or you'll have something where it's like you're, you're, in, you're in operations or workflow for some department and your job is to help them accelerate with AI. But if you don't know the underlying discipline in that department, you're not going to be very useful. So like, Imagine an accounting firm wants to, you know, do something with, let's say, taxes, 
and 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 um and their tax services like you're you could go in like i could go in there like hey i'm a prompt engineer and they'll be like okay what do you know about taxes and i'm like not very much uh, and like what am i actually going to be able to do for them without having that underlying knowledge so it's really about i think combining Oh my God, I just said it's about, which is like the cringe thing that ChatGPT keeps saying these days. It's not about this, it's about that. Um, it's it's really about combining your expertise, your knowledge, what you know how to do with your ability to use tools, right? So previously software developers were doing this before and they would create cool little apps and things. And I was always very jealous of it. Well, now I can kind of do the same thing and create my little GPTs and my automations workflows and stuff in the same manner but it's like I'm still amplifying my underlying skill. And like, that's why I'm successful with it. Not just because I'm like writing a prompt and using AI, um, because, but because I'm putting things together. Allie? Well, interestingly enough, <laughs> um, OpenAI just released, I didn't have time to write a, a post about it yet, but they just released their prompt engineering guide. So um, fits right in here as well. However, again, I didn't have a time to look at it yet in detail, but it looks like it has very similar instructions as we have already been promoting, meaning, you know, provide clear instructions, provide reference text, um, split complex tasks into simpler ones, give model time to think, use external tools, test changes systematically. I'm literally just reading from that um, guide. And then they show some tactics how to do that. And, you know, like here is how to ask a, you know, not so good question and here's how you can do it better. Now, um, just chiming in on top of that, what both Matt and Rob, you said, I agree with both of you. And this is also what I'm observing. And I think that the prompt engineering that potentially was fascinating first for a lot of people was that, oh, well, if I can kind of figure out how this works and I can help others. But I too think that prompt engineering, specifically the way that, you know, in the industry or even Anthropic talks about, it's still about working with the LLMs or the machine learning or the systems, which means that it's not just like, okay, well, you're going to just document this, like there's more to it, right? I mean, that's why you get paid big bucks to do that job. And whereas for the user, and one of the things that I do, um, I purposely throw stuff at ChatGPT, for example, and I do the same with Claude, where I try to be like a regular person, right? Meaning, yes, I know I can use markup, I can use all these different techniques, and I do use them. But I'm trying to also think through that if I am the person just to answer the question or like ask as I maybe would normally ask, and I try to do it in a few different ways. And I want to see what I get. Because I can, and I'm hearing this, and I, not lately as much, but a couple of months ago, I was hearing more how some people were getting frustrated that they were not getting the outputs that they were looking for, but they also didn't have the solution and figuring out how you can actually then get the output that you're looking for. And yes, for that, you'll have to massage or reiterate and go over and change things. And then this comes back to your own critical thinking or how you maybe apply what you already know. So then this is the augmentation of what you already know instead of taking what you get at face value and specifically when it can be, you know, a little bit of a still in the hallucination area or you're not really sure if that is true or not. And the default answers can sound very much the same where it delves into, using another word that ChatGPT likes to use, so, so same with Claude, but it all, you know, I mean, where does it go from here, right? So there's going to be people that will be using it in their job as a, a developer, engineer, and actually working with the systems where they will be doing prompt engineering, but then also, okay, we are already seeing this super alignment or super intelligence where you know, a smaller system can teach a larger system or however that is, we have synthetic data. There's there's a lot of variables here. So 
where does that leave us uh, as you know people in this realm is perhaps to be seen and then from the other side okay for the you know if we're trying to make it accessible for everybody then i think that the the way that we use it um should be easy and intuitive enough for people that you know, may not have the prompt engineering skills that it would be easy to use and they get the, you know, at least in general, the answers that they want. Right. And I feel like it would be remiss if I didn't bring up one of the developments from this week. Um, three days ago, you know, uh, Microsoft released that paper about their med prompt technique. And so what was what was interesting about this, and it was kind of fun, um, if, if you guys were following the story. So, uh, a while ago, they they ran GPT-4 on a benchmark using a, a technique called chain of thought and using a, um, what is it, a, like five uh, example, uh, multi, a multi-shot prompt with five examples. And they achieved like an 86% on the MMLU benchmark, which was like really amazing. And everyone thrilled for GPT-4. And then Gemini came in like a week ago with Gemini Ultra and said that they had achieved a 90 over a 90% on the MMLU by uh with their Gemini Ultra model, right? So everyone's going like, "Ooh, Gemini Ultra beats GPT-4," even though they used chain of thought and a 32 multi-shot prompt to help the model overcome it. So it wasn't exactly the same, but what <laughs> then Microsoft comes back a few days later with their med prompt, which is like a a framework for prompting um in a more sophisticated way that, that gets the AI to kind of think through uh, the challenge and its constraints and, and how to do it. And then they go and beat Gemini Ultra with their new med prompt, which is like, a, it's basically a, a sophisticated chain of thought. And I think it has 31 <laughs> prompts in the multi-shot prompt. So it's like, um, the the big guys are are battling it out in terms of, you know, trying to prove that their model is the best. But on the topic of prompting, they're able to take this GPT-4 model from 86% to, to like 90.7% or something, which I know doesn't sound like a huge improvement. Like, oh, it's only plus 4% from 86 to 90. But that's just based on the prompt. They're, they're, this is And this is one of the hardest benchmarks you know, to, to really score on for a lot of the smaller models. Just with the prompt, they're able to overcome a few more of those hurdles that are preventing the model from hitting the benchmark. And this is the kind of stuff that makes me obsessed with prompting because like, I want my stuff to be just a little bit better than everybody else's. And there's, there's just magic in a few sentences sometimes that can get you that advantage. And, uh, and, you know, it, so if those advantages exist, like I, I want them and I'm going to go figure it out. So um, such a such a fun thing. Sometimes just a few words, Rob, you know, make such a difference. But um, just thinking about that, I just used your GPT, the uh, business page, one page snippet um, creator. And that is amazing, especially how you created it so that you could just dump as much information in there as possible and it was able to do basically what you were teaching in your first uh prompt the chat gpt prompting class uh the content creator or co uh, content reactor i'm sorry um how you would teach how to do the multi prompts and the uh, big large prompts that you did all that into the gpt so that it gave me all that information in a one page um snippet and gave me all the different things that i would need to develop multiple different parts of types of content for a brand right see we can we can do a little magic with this um i posted if, if you're curious about what heather is talking about if you scroll back on my posts to last wednesday i think it was so um nine days ago i posted a link I've, i was supposed to publish a newsletter with this in it um but the idea was you take a whole bunch of information about your business or you take a URL of your business website or you know a sales of some sales materials for your product or something you dump it into this GPT whatever you got you dump it in and it spits out like a summary of all the important aspects of your product of your audience of what people care about of why they would buy and then you can use this kind of consistent report to prompt for other things so you would never want to be like hey write me an email to someone who just signed up for my product 
And here I'm going to like paste all this garbage gobbledygook in, in and hopefully you can figure out what our, my business is about, right? Like that would be too confusing, too many steps for the AI. So um, what I've been thinking a lot about is how do we create these like standard or more standard inputs that then we can use as building blocks for other things. And I, I really do think that in the future, every business should essentially have a, some some go-to snippets that explain their their company that explain their product or whatever it is. And that like, it's like, you should roll this out to your entire workforce and say, hey, if you ever need to prompt something for this product, like here's a starting point to explain the product and then drop your prompt in after and chat GPT will do such a better job with it. So really fun to kind of be thinking about the new form of work and, and how do we empower not just um, ourselves, but even like other people in our organizations to be able to do these things without needing to understand prompting and prompt engineering. Yeah. And that's the great thing about it because I was trying to write a couple of threads for a client. And then um, I just pretty much put the URLs and I put copied and pasted articles from their blog and dropped it in there. And just a few things like that in information sheet. And it gave me, it pulled the information from that and it was so succinct and easy to understand so I picked out something that I, a topic I wanted to focus on and asked it to write a couple of threads, example threads. Then I could start working with that. And I dropped that into Tweet Hunter, which has GPT 3.5 or something in there. And I don't know if you are aware, but Tweet Hunter has a whole suite of um, AI tools now that are completely different than used to be, the, including image generation. And it's pretty good. So you can generate your images for your your hooks and your threads or whatever inside Tweet Hunter. But I like to use the the rate how it rates your tweet or rates your um, post. I like to use that because it'll tell you whether it's going to be um, above average or you know pretty successful, and that kind of gives me an idea of whether I should try to rewrite it in a different way. But when I put it in there, I start working with it and I was able to develop all types of other things with it. And with these GPTs, I would like to stress that you don't have to only stop at what the GPT says it does because it's still within chat GPT, right? So you could ask for additional information that you're, it wasn't supposed to, you know, um, produce a thread, but it did. Then I asked it to give me um, some images that would cover like a hook. I wanted some hook images to post with it, right? But I see that you programmed it not to do that, but it did have the code if I wanted to do that. <laughs> but I th see where giving it some constraints is helpful. But I was kind of like, let me push it a little bit further and see if I can go ahead and get a couple of Dolly images <laughs> out of it. But um, how, what do you do with that code that is produced just out of curiosity? Like how would I, would I be able to generate an image with that? I, you've lost me a little bit in terms of exactly what you're asking. And by the way, it, guys, if you are in chat GBT, sometimes when you ask for images, it just won't give them to you because it thinks that I think, well, first of all, they've had like a weird bug, like the laziness bug or whatever, where chat GBT has just been refusing for no good reason to do stuff. And I've had people in my AI community being like, hey, Rob, do you know what this is about? And I'm like, no, like that's straight up not how it works. But it, it does have a few things it won't generate images of. It, it, and, it, and it won't do with regard to images. It won't generate images of political figures, um, celebrities, like well-known people. And it won't try and personally identify pictures. Like if you upload a picture and try and do something. So like if you upload your profile picture and say like, hey, make a different version of me wearing a hat, it'll go, I can't do that because you're trying to like make a personally identifiable version of yourself, like, like it, it, it breaks it. So, so sometimes if it's resisting, it's not like the prompt of the GPT, it's actually the system prompt behind Dolly. Um, but uh, but uh, you lost me on, on your question about codes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know I went all over the place with that one, but no, I just, it was, it was none of those things. It just had to do with, um, I wanted a scene that kind of just like evoked the, the, um, what the point of the thread was. And it was like a cyberpunk thing. It wasn't anything with any particular, um, like somebody like a hacker, basically. No, no political figures, but it did give me, it gave me a link that I couldn't open the file. You know how when um, the code interpreter used to give um. you like that link 
so it produced that instead of an image. So I clicked on that and it just, it didn't give me anything. Um, but I noticed that it had code and I opened up and it had the code block and I think it was Python maybe. So I was just wondering what I could copy that and put it into a code editor, but I wasn't sure. But that no, is I, way off topic and I am so sorry. <laughs> you know, but oh, that far in the weeds. I th- I th- this could be fun for people because so what what I think happened is it got confused. It tried to do something. Maybe that process failed. And when it's running with Code Interpreter, it's like writing lo- Python live there in the browser and executing it in you know in a test environment and then returning the results. It was probably trying to like generate an image and save it for you or something. And maybe the image generation failed, but it still then tried to save something. And then the save failed. And now you've got this, you're looking at this code that that it's executing to try and do all that stuff. And I think sometimes it just gets tripped up. I mean, it's remarkable. And this is actually, I think, one of the most remarkable things that ChatGPT has done that people don't talk enough about. It's remarkable that it can do something like get a prompt from you and go, okay, according to this instruction, I need to execute something. So I'm going to try and write some code for it. And then it writes the code and it runs it. And then it looks at whatever the the code did. And it, and it, has, and it asks itself, did this actually accomplish the thing in, from the prompt that the user asked for? And if it doesn't work, it'll go back and try and write better code. And it'll like cycle through this three times Eventually, it'll give up. It like if it, if it can't do it under in like within two minutes or something. But like, it is absolutely remarkable that the AI will keep trying. And while it's easy to do with code, I think that we're going to see more and more of this with other types of tasks, where where the AIs of the future will be willing to self evaluate, decide if they did a good job, try again. You know, like I I have a lot of prompt uh, sequences where like for content creation where it's like think of something and do an outline outline is step one and then like write it is step two and then like edit it and look for problems is like step three you know imagine it being able to do all those things self-sufficiently and not only that but know that like hey the best way to write something is maybe to have an idea of what you're going to write before you write it i should do an outline first and have that spit out kind of like when it writes that python code um and this is all it's all stuff you can do manually but i think that the the ais of 2024 i think somebody will create something that does that automatically some combo of an autonomous agent like a, a, a or a multi cycle agent a, that feels a little bit more like a chatbot right now at, like autonomous agents are kind of their own can of worms and they don't they don't quite operate in the same way as a chatbot. And I, I think we need a, a blending of the two and chat GPT is probably going to give it to us. Yeah, we might have that sooner than we think too. And, but I think you're right about that, where, the, where it was writing the code because I didn't take the time to save it, but I bet if I dropped it into a code editor, it probably would because it was showing like where on the page that it was going to appear on what lines and it had coordinates and different things. So I really appreciate that. Um, Scovels, hello, Robert. I'm going to get you a mic in a second here. But um, uh, I, there's just so many little things that are happening, and we haven't gotten to the VR and AR. I forgot about that. Oh. <laughs> and Bilal's not here either to talk about what he was going to talk about. Welcome. Welcome, Robert. What's up? I've enjoyed listening to the reports because this is a huge year. And I didn't know many of the people in the community at the beginning of this year. That tells us something has happened. Well, what has been your biggest, um, well, yeah, what was your biggest? It would be, I would love to hear. I think what was the biggest impact after that? For me, chat GPT, particularly after my psychiatrist, did the demo where we talked for half an hour and it wrote really detailed notes on on me. Um, that's when I knew, okay, this is not Siri or Alexa anymore. You know, it's funny, Robert, when you posted that, the first thing I thought of was AI girlfriend <laughs> and and how they're going to like know their know things about their boyfriends and be able. To, their so-called boyfriends and be able to act and on girlfriends. Them. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's going to know you pretty well eventually, but right now it 
it still has a lot of holes. But it's getting, so after that, it's what getting do you pretty think interesting. It? <laughs> um, I I've enjoyed meeting, watching the AI art community go from nobody doing it to you know thousands of people doing it on X alone, and and other, many more over on Discord. So yeah, um, and watching the progression because a year ago it was not giving you the images it is today and not giving you videos and so watching what the community is doing and starting to tell stories with these tools that's true it, i think it has kind of like bled into all these different areas where those of us who might not have thought that we had the creative creativity for art or visual content. Now we have might maybe we had a story to tell and we didn't have a way to tell it. And that visual, um, when Rob, I think you were saying how when you saw the different images and the video, text to video, it, that was very powerful. Even like with Gen Two, when you all these images that I finally learned how to create and generate and kind of manipulate into what I wanted. When I could see them moving, it was kind of like, wait a minute, it all started over again. Because then you start thinking, well, what else can I uh, make move? Maybe what type of uh, image, not just photo, photorealistic, what about making illustrations move? Anime, I mean, just it's it was just amazing. But the world of opportunities that opened up from that. And with VR and AR, I think, um, Robert, you were, you've always said, well, we'll be building what we'll be look, looking at through these glasses and through these goggles and on whatever screen, what we're prompting now. Like, what do you think about the impact of that? We're heading towards automatic prompting for the end user, for the consumer, right? It, it should know you pretty well, pretty quickly. <laughs> so it should be able to get ahead of you you know, and suggest music you want, right? And have that pre cash for you and suggest dinner for you, right? Get ahead of you. And it's it, it'll be pretty confident doing that. Has anybody here tried the trick yet where you take a photo like of your fridge and then you give it to, to one of the multimodal LLMs like ChatGPT and say like, what should I make for dinner? I still haven't, like yeah. this is, this is the future we've been promised that I haven't tried yet, but I, I want to try and it's make okay something. It's okay at that. I, I did the spice rack and the, and the refrigerator. It sometimes can't see quantities and sometimes isn't completely accurate, but it gets you started. And that's one thing people forget is, you know, if it gets eight out of 10 items in your refrigerator, at least it gets you started. And then you right. can tell, oh, you missed the milk and you missed the eggs. I had to guess, I bet Robert Scoble probably has an AI fridge already. No. <laughs> Everybody's getting one all at the same time. <laughs> um, to, to me, this is an awesome moment to kind of segue into predictions for 2024. What's even more mind-blowing, though, oh. about computer vision, I aimed it at my uh, wife's Iranian food. And it told me Dutch in in Iranian in Persian, and told me how to make it, and told me what was in the soup. It's insane, from a freaking picture, right? So you go over somebody's Christmas dinner and you take a picture of their food because their food is really cool. It'll tell you how to. It should be able to get to the place where it tells you how to make it. It certainly can tell you how to make ash soup, Iranian ash soup. So awesome. All right, I'm going to try that transition one more time, guys. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, one of the things we wanted to do on this on this spaces today was make some predictions for 2024. And I'm pretty excited to think about, you know, images, video, open source, LLMs, on mobile, you know, wearables. There, there's so many places for us to to wonder when we get to December 15th, you know, a year from now, how has the world changed? And like, I'm going to start by saying I predict in 2024 that open source beats the incumbent big corporate model in some remarkable way that we have a 
we we actually see the open source and so, somehow surpass the GPT four, the GPT five, or something in a in a with a new novel, com completely unexpected thing, and then it throws the entire system upside down. I think that's one thing that we have coming for us um, next year. What Anybody if else? Apple have went open source. <laughs> oh, Apple would never, right? It's it's against what if their. They did. <laughs> You know, if you're going to dream, dream big. <laughs> you never know, I guess. You, you never know. Happen. <laughs> I've, I've changed big companies like Microsoft, so I know it's possible. <laughs> well, I wonder what will happen, like the way that AI is being used in schools, like education and healthcare. If more by next um, year, will it be more natural for people to use it because it's already integrated with a lot of the systems that people are using right now, even though they don't realize it. So I hope, I wonder if it'll be like maybe a, an assistant to teachers when they're teaching subjects to have an image generated or something like that, or to have a summary come up created based on that topic and to give writing prompts to students, things like that or to teach color theory or, or you know, complementary colors, the color wheel, math. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, for teachers that are willing to embrace it, there are already a bunch of great tools and workflows for generating lesson plans and for grading papers um, or like certain certain kinds of, of homework where the teacher was, is like literally doing the same basic mundane thing 32 times or whatever for every student in their in their um, class. And there's no reason for a human to need to go through all those math problems and check them or whatever. Um, like, I think there is a reason for you to go through and see what are students doing well? Where do they need help? What, how should I adapt tomorrow's lecture or tomorrow's activity? Um, but th like, there's, I think that there's a lot of really easy low hanging fruit that isn't even controversial with, that's just to say like, hey, I mean, if you think about the structure of the educational environment, it's way more structured than almost anything that we do in life. You know, you go for a set amount of time, you have a curriculum or curricula like that you're kind of following and that's outlined and you're supposed to kind of go from this skill to this skill to this skill. And everything needs an activity and everything needs some kind of recall event like a month or a week and then a month later to re remind you what you learned. Like all that stuff is perfect for AI. And my so my great hope for next year and, and the years beyond is that we get past this like, oh, my kids are using it to do their homework, you know, argument, which I, I feel like isn't even the most important argument. About? I'm using the AI to help my kid do his homework. Me too. Right. Exactly. You know, <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, but like uh, sometimes when I'm helping a kid with some homework and it's something where they're teaching it differently than the way I learned. Like with math and stuff, they're like teaching math in new ways. And I'm like, I, what, I, I don't know what this is. <laughs> they're like, yeah, I'm supposed to draw the squares. I got second year of calculus in university, right? And I see algebra now. I have no fucking idea. So, I mean, we, so I, I have think... to do a refresher course. On <laughs> oh, it's hard. Homework. Yeah. You got to like type the entire like word problem in there for kindergarten. Honestly, no, you take a picture the of the answers. sheet and give it to chat GPT and say, chat GPT, I need some uh, parenting help. My kid has a problem. <laughs> and I, this is serious. Huh? This is no, no, no. I, I have four kids. Believe me, I, I'm laughing because <laughs> I wish that this was available a few years ago. Now they're all old enough that it doesn't help as much, but I could have definitely used this, you know, but my youngest yeah. is in middle school. So yeah, <laughs> starting no, to I'm hit like, these weird math problems. <laughs> oh, it, no, it's been coming since uh, elementary. I read articles years ago about not having math anxiety so that your kids don't get upset because I would say things like, what is this they're doing? What, what is this new way? <laughs> and, you know, because that is what it is. I have no idea how you draw squares and with um, algebra and what does that mean? Or, you know, um, whatever it is with the division problems, that's just a nightmare, long division right now. The way they do it, I don't understand it. But I was with, in Sidja, Spain, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, took a picture of the church. It told me about the church in the town. Then I saw a plaque that was in Latin. I took a picture of that and it translated it to me, right? The education impacts of this are just 
stunning. My one of my um, sons yesterday was just showing me how you could look on Google Maps and see a moving timeline. Did you all know that <laughs> he was showing us for our neighborhood and the area that we live in? You could like went back thirty years to see um, real time, like how did it grow and where do these neighborhoods come from and the different housing and developments. And you, he said, I've been doing this all over the world, but that's just the kind of things that you can do with this that people they really get kind of bogged down with. Um, you know, the kid's going to do their homework with it. It's like, well, no, you can do different types of homework with that type of capability. And my parents were public school teachers and in the unions, and I support it. And I know that there's so many things. There's a lot of kids that fall between the cracks and the teachers don't have enough time to devote to each student. So if you could maybe answer, if they were able to get an answer immediately, that rather than waiting until the teacher has an oppor uh, opportunity to talk to them, just imagine how quickly they would be able to kind of keep up and it would give the teacher more time to develop things that are fun or things that are meaningful. I hope that we're able to do that. And healthcare too. There's who doesn't have to wait when they're at um, healthcare providers to give them some type of way where they can funnel some of that information into the uh, AI could help patients fill out the paperwork faster. Oh, I thought you were going to tell it because when you put on the Apple Vision Pro, it's looking at the back of your eye and it can see 13 different diseases on the back of your eye. Well, so I love that. You that you're going to need to go to the optometrist for cataracts. Well, that would know, be helpful. Like but I don't, you, I think that might take a little longer for people to be able to trust it reliably without, it's you know, Apple. um, you know, thinking, I know, but the people right now, they're, Apple. everybody's cautioning, like, don't take advice from it. And, you know, oh, no, you know it, people it's will. Apple, so it won't give you advice unless the FDA has approved Apple. To oh, no, no, no. I, I think those, not that, those type of implications too, especially for identifying things with um, imaging and radiology, that there's so many things that are missed, you know, from even with the, the technology we have now, I think it will be wonderful to be able to identify stuff faster and more accurately. It can put a check engine light on your wrist and say you need to go see a doctor, even though it internally it might know you're showing signs of, let's say, a cardiac problem. It's not allowed to say that until the FDA approves the system to say that to you. Oh, that is a good I, idea. I did take a photo of my, my blood work and, and give it to an AI and and jailbreak it to try and tell me all the all the things that it could try and figure out from it and it was quite interesting it was it was it was actually totally aligned with what my doctor's recommendations were but it was fun to like to see that but I I think while we're thinking about 2024 and predictions like let, let's keep it spicy in here a little bit I want to talk about AI influencers and we've had this year the rise of a lot of like Instagram personalities and and other. You're people not talking who... about Robert Scovel on X. You're talking about an AI that's you know, on Instagram, and there's no human. Involved. Right. Well, there are humans involved, but it's ah, like true. It's You're collecting it's, the cash. <laughs> right. It's like that that super hot you know, Brazilian woman is actually like a woman in India who's making 20 times, you know, what she used to make as a freelance content creator, because um, now she's just running like a sexy Instagram. But like, so my, what do you guys think is going to happen next year? The technology is getting good. We have, we have all this like animate anyone, you know, TikTok videos from images and from motion capture. It seems to me like we should see an explosion of this kind of content and almost like some kind of reckoning between the humans and the and the AIs, and and maybe even some backlash by the end of the year, uh, you know, from like legit human influencers who are like, like this is just kind of like real life cartoons. Like, what's up, guys? Don't you want to like look at me? Like, why do you want to look at this fake if thing? If you're a human performer and you can't compete with an AI, shame on you. Right. Wow, shame on you. <laughs> right. I think that's a fair assessment, though. Hey, everyone. No, I'm sorry, seriously, sorry. <laughs> I've heard a lot of AI music. It's not as good as human music if, you list, if you're looking for a certain thing, right? Which is entertainment. Yeah, it might be true. Is my voice okay? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we can hear you. Nice. I've been tweeting a lot about this this week because I had like this... Um, 
image come up when I was playing around with Midjourney that I thought was like, oh, Jesus Christ, this is kind of unbelievable in terms of quality. Um, and then people that are making uh, these influencers, there's actually an agency here in Barcelona that runs two of the big ones. Uh, they started to reach out and then more people reached out. And now I have this kind of like weird kind of DMs in my inbox with like people building these influencers. And unfortunately, most of them are uh, female uh, influencers that they're making. And I, I, regardless of that, like, do I think that the this will be an explosion of this online? Yes, uh, I do. Um, and it's because like, we're, as a society, we're quite screwed in a way. Like we, we kind of, if we look at social media, the, the kind of content that works is actual real humans putting out this content. So why wouldn't it work if it's manufactured to be as good as it possibly can be to kind of focus on the same audience? And to Rob's point, like what will happen between the, the humans and the non-humans, the NPCs on these platforms uh, that are run by potentially humans? Um, that's the interesting question. What will happen with the platforms themselves? Will they start regulating AI generated content or will they kind of endorse it? Because like in a way, they are making money if people are the engaged. The Beatles used AI to mo I, modify their music. So what I, happens when exactly. Taylor Swift uses AI to modify her music and her brand exactly. and her imagery and her characters and her brand, you know? I, I think you, you put it well, Robert, there were like, uh, if a human cannot compete with an AI, the human is doing something wrong, and then maybe the AI, the, the human needs to start using AI as well. But it's we're entering some really interesting times where it's all of a sudden possible for, for people to kind of create NPCs that pose as real humans and, and then put them out into the world. Um, and, and the capabilities of... of They're getting of pretty good, except for latency. Still yeah, latency uh, and, and I mean, video improving. So who, who knows? Like like Rob yeah. said, animate anything. You know, where will we be? Like, what's the quality going to be like? When are we getting a magnificent video? Depends on the question you ask it, right? If you only yeah. need a, a simple thing, like, uh, you know, something simple, like where's an in and out that's uh, uh, something a smaller model can answer real fast. If you need a college essay on a chemistry topic or something like that, you'd probably want to go to the biggest chat GPT or whoever <laughs> has the biggest model at the, mo at the moment, right? Yeah, I, th I think Rob was also talking about these kind of like Instagram influencers, right? Like uh, easy, easy uh, dressed uh, men and, and girls uh, that are kind of raking in millions because of partnerships and then once they start posting uh, less photos of, with less clothes on, there's no way going back to, to normal photos because then their likes are not, you know, what they used to be or whatever. Like this kind of category of influencers, uh, they're going to get a really hard time because there's just going to be so many uh, avatars that are, are, are manufactured that are not going to be real. That's my take on this. Right. I will say um, while hands have gotten a lot better, um, I'm still not getting good feet pics from Stable Diffusion or any of the other models. So there's a couple categories of influencers are safe for now. <laughs> but Somebody how started many creating months? some data sets of feet pictures. <laughs> how many <laughs> months is it before the fingers get fixed and the feet get fixed, right? You know, 18 months or less. I've been seeing extra legs frequently now. Has anyone else noticed that in multiple different uh, <laughs> generators? No, extra like an extra leg just kind of popping up. No, I, I see that. I still yeah. see arms too, and some random, you know, hand around somebody's shoulder. Okay, yeah, yeah, it just appears out of. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but start a new brand, multiple arm uh, art. You know, <laughs> it's getting to be a lot of work, magnifique and things like that, and Photoshop and Linda Wyman takes the uh, errors in her three D printed uh, pottery and she paints the errors gold because. You know, that's the randomness in the whole thing. Oh, that I, would be I, it. One, one thing I'd love to uh, just interject here, hopefully my voice is coming through, is like to Rob and Linus's yeah. point earlier, is it, it's like, uh, you know, is the uh, sort of the OnlyFans, the TikToker, AI versus non-AI, like is that a false dichotomy or is it going to be kind of like Linus, you were saying this earlier when we were chatting, it's like, you know, currently in self-driving, you've got one human monitoring like, you know, 20 different cars at once. You could just have, like, one human monitoring, like, 20 different, like, whatever, conversations, content creation sessions, because we'll we'll want more and more personalized stuff, right? And I think wherever you had the, had the human as the orchestrator, the quality is going to be perceptively better, at least in the near term. So, yeah, I wonder if it's just going to be, like, 
a single creator that's now managing like 30 influencer accounts, right? Across a variety of different niches or something like that. And perhaps the same thing on OnlyFans, having like far more, I don't know, personalized conversations versus some like some really, really generic generative stuff. I donated I think this all is a- of my 17 years of uh, uh, data here on X.com to the public <laughs> domain, and I already have something like three different AIs running around doing shit and getting in trouble. And then there's a separate one on Cup of Soup, which is a little app that you can put your picture in and then it takes your AI and takes it places. I would say like uh, this is already happening as well, Bill Wall. Like uh, I pinned a, a post at the top here from Micah uh, Berkeley. Um, he, he's opening that post with like uh, I sell virtual influencers to brand and their customers have no idea. So I think we're in this period of time now where people have a hard time understanding that they might interact with with NPCs or generated AI contents. But he's managing a lot of <laughs> of, of NPCs, right? I, he's grown a handful of, of accounts to plus 100,000 uh, followers on, on Instagram. And I think this just shows where we are right now. And, and it would be naive to think that we would not have, you know, a thousand micas or, or 10,000 micas by the end of next year. This I just is visited, Lil Miguel um, on steroids, right? This is like, oh my God. It's imperceptible too. It's like that part is is absolutely, absolutely wild. And Instagram, oh my God, Instagram's like probably the easiest game to play, right? Especially if it's all still imagery. The video stuff, maybe you can still kind of tell. But yeah, I'm looking at these examples. It's like, holy crap, we have crossed the chasm of uncanniness when it comes to still imagery. Yeah, and even like this, the kind of um, video that you, if you look at Fit, um, I, 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 Fit Aitana, like the the the, the Barcelona based uh, AI influencer that's run by a couple that has a um, a studio here. Um, they kind of mix. So while the the photo stream, the grid uh, is basically all AI generated. Her stories they are uh, recorded in real life, but they don't show her face. They show they show her potential POV. So we I think we're going to see a lot of that, like a hybrid where like the, the the still frames at this point because the technology does not allow for good video. They're going to be AI generated and they're going to be very good. And then video is going to be kind of POV, but like recorded by humans. So. Yeah, I, we're very early in this in this race, and but I think this is just uh, the us scratching the very very surface of what's going to be possible here. And this t- yeah. kind of technology is affecting all sorts of things. I I just visited Luma Field in San Francisco, which is their R and D facility. They're headquartered in Boston. They make CAT scan machines for manufacturing lines. They take pictures of things like um, an uh, inhaler or uh, uh, an electric motor that might go into a robot, like a DGI or something like that. Um, and it can see inside. It's an X-ray machine. And it's, it sees down to six microns resolution. Very, it's half the size of a human red cell. So this is a new kind of uh, quality control machine on American manufacturing. And it's run by AI. And they're building another AI so that the operator can talk to the machine. And it's spitting out uh, data sets that are volumetric pixels. Oh, who does that? Matt does that. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, speaking of a, robotics. We can send a picture of an electric motor over to Matt and say, here's a 3D vo- voxel field, you know, <laughs> Gaussian splat field. Here, do something with this. So awesome. Um, speaking of robotics and, and machines, we now saw this year um, with the Optimus bot by Tesla being trained just on video. And so for the first time, we've got robots who, who can be trained to do something by watching it, not by doing it. So if you if you think about the viral videos of training robots in the past, like the, the dog one, now I can't think of the name, you'd see these Bot- videos of like... Dynamics. Yeah, where they're like kicking the dog and trying to knock it over. And then it's like trying to balance and get back up and they have to kick it like 10,000 times to teach it how to how to steady itself. Well, imagine now instead of having to have a human like pushing on the spot, we can show, you know, pictures of people getting bumped or jostled or stumbling or whatever. And then um, I'm kind of making up this example, like this may not be a perfect one, but basically the the process of training now um, we're we're opening up 
the amount of data that we, ha we have available into a whole nother level, right? Like it's it's just like for RLHF for um, you know getting the human feedback into a language model is very expensive, very language, uh, very labor intensive because to have humans like look at all the outputs and annotate them and feed them back in the machine, super expensive to have an army of people doing that one by one. But imagine now, oh, so same thing with training robots, but imagine now we could just go into the realm of what's on video. What are all the things that we have on video? Um, and what are all the videos that we can sort of make and shoot from different angles um, a lot more easily than like, trying to teach a robot how to do it by like literally if moving you can its imagine arms. imagine it, I think YouTube has video for it. Right. And so, you know, we're going to get into this world where it's like, hey, I, I want my robot like to make, I mean, probably not next year, but like, I want to, I want to teach it how I make my tacos at home. I fry the shells, a little bit of oil, corn tortilla, you know, like I, I get my ground turkey, like all this stuff. Imagine it could like watch me, help me. And then the, like the next day it's cooking the meal for me or like, you know, like we're, we're kind of like headed toward this future. That, I think this is. Yeah, coming. for I sure. Gotta... That's where we are. I mean, we are there. Like, I, I think what's interesting now with the vision training is that we, we me and Bill Wells spoke, spoke about this earlier, we're basically having LLMs uh, inside of these robotic systems uh, will give all these robot robots, like a very good baseline understanding of the world, like a general understanding of the world. Uh, and, and vision is just like, look at this the Tesla self-driving, right? Like it's the same kind of problem. They're yes. it's only trained on visuals um, and, and it, it's going to get crazy. And I don't think people understand really the ramp up that we are on and like how incredibly fast things are going to move. So I, I don't know if you've, you've read the, the weak to strong generalization paper that got released by OpenAI yesterday. Um, but essentially like we're getting to the point where we're talking about super alignment. So, instead of we, we don't have enough data so like we're saying like they, if you can think about it youtube might have the data yeah it's very true but like to train these systems it, not even youtube has enough data so we're, we're getting to this this stage where we're going to 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 have to rely on 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 synthesized data on the synthetic data to be to get kind of used so again back to the simple point like these robots are trained on vision alone uh, the system, the self-driving system of Tesla is trained on vision alone. Uh, it's, a, it's a singular kind of system that operates. And, and, and Rob, you're saying like, yeah, it, it can cook the thing in, in, in the way I like it. The key the key thing here is that it, it initially has an understanding about what even like cooking taco means. But the, the, the golden piece of this puzzle is that you will be able to show it maybe with once how you want your tacos to be made. And that one single time is going to act like a All you need tuning. is one picture of my wife's Osh soup, and, <laughs> and Chat GPT can tell you the recipe for the soup. Exactly, but but to the point that I want it to be made exactly like this. I want it to, you know, I want you to do it exactly like you're, this. You're to... right on point. Um, I met an Optimus employee, who, an engineer, recently, and he bragged to me that the Optimus is learning faster than any other AI team, and as learning. Learn more tasks, he bragged to me, in uh, 18 months than Boston Dynamics has learned in 13 years. And he said, next year, it's going to speed up the rate of learning. So in 18 months, it's going to learn a lot of things. So you yeah, even so, before so, the world totally of uh, robots, though, like when can I have some AI on my desktop looking at what I'm doing in After Effects and just do it for me and replicate that. <laughs> Who, who's working on that? Can somebody give me that? Because like, I honestly... already have Rewind watching my Mac, listening to me talk, writing notes on meetings and stuff, right? So you've got, so... The, uh, you've got the actions that you're doing being nicely recorded, right? Like now we just need an AI to actually like It's on your local them. desktop, so the multimodal models haven't got gotten to the local desktop yet you know it's happening coming. It's, it's coming <laughs> like can, can we just like tomorrow, I, want to, tonight. I want to <laughs> i want to see if we can take a question here so asif yavid he was at, asking uh was, first of all thank you yavid for listening in and and thank you for for being part of the space so he was asking if there's a mechanism that we can use to identify human-made content from ai generated content we've spoken about this previously uh, on, on these weekly spaces I think the assumption that people need to have to to kind of set their minds in the right position is that everything and anything that you see online will be generated. Um, that's kind of the baseline. And if you have that as a baseline, the thing that we need to to learn to discern is whether or not something is human or not. So I think verifying humanity, verifying human presence is going to be huge. 
Whoever works on so that. I have a picture of the Grand Canyon taken at sunset on my iPhone. And if you compare it to what the AI gives you now, the AI actually is more pleasing. It's more fun to look at the picture that comes out of the AI than the real picture I shot at sunset with my phone. Well, it's also kind of like when people... Um, so look for the boring one. Question. That's the human one. <laughs> but it's sort of like, well, does it matter? How much does it matter for whether or not it's um, AI written or human or or even the image? Like, the, the, depends the AI on what one's not as accurate. So it right, but I mean, it's like for in general, not even just for pictures, but for articles. If it, the information is written in a way that it helps you and it gives you the information that you need... Does it matter if it is human generated or AI generated? And I see this a lot, like on Medium, a lot of the writers are, you know, kind of in two camps where they're like, well, you know, they're anti the AI or this, this is how you find out if it's written this way. And others are just using it to help. It's not necessarily 100% AI written, but they're using it to help structure their articles and things like that. What do you all think about does it matter? or if the video was created strictly by AI. Per, 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 Millie person. Danilli got in trouble for lip syncing in the early days, right? I went to Coachella a few times and saw, uh, you know, Cascade give a concert. I was in the in front of the front row because I had a photo pit pass so I could watch him perform really closely. He didn't even do anything. He t hit play at the beginning of his show and his whole show was scripted. All he did was dance. He didn't perform at all. So uh, times change. And yeah. that's what we're going to see happen in AI uh, space as well. And that's a good point, too. Like for music, um, a lot, everybody uses different types of um, enhancement and um, auto tune and things like that when they're singing. Like, does it matter? Do we really want to hear people without any kinds of. Uh, additional stuff. Alina, go ahead. I, I don't saying? think I, I don't think it matters uh, whether or not the content per se is AI generated. I, I do think it matters at scale. I do think it matters, um, you know, if, 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 if for, for me, for example, uh, and, and many of us in here, like if someone were to steal my voice and, and kind of act on my behalf and it was AI generated, um, but you couldn't tell. If I were speaking right now and you're listening to this and, and, and it could be AI generated, but you could not tell. That's where I'm going to have issues with this. And that's when I, I, I think it's important to be able to verify whether or not something that's being put out is being put out by the actual human or if it's not. And and if, if we assume the baseline is that anything that you hear me say or, or release or, or write uh, is considered to be a high generated, if that's your default, then it becomes really simple to look for the markers. This is a human verified post or this is an actual human speaking I think we've seen today um, this kind of new kind of LoRa L LCM running with a browser and, and, and the webcam taking um, your input in the webcam and then whatever you prompt it to be showing you a rudimentary deep fake of, of something else. This is just the beginning. Uh, and if we've learned anything this year with AI generated images and how fast that has moved, we can just assume that it will move equally fast with video because video is essentially images strung together. Um, so I'm taking I'm taking a side there when it's like people getting hurt or disinformation is being spread, uh, and it's not easy to verify whether or not the source is human or not. Then it matters. Otherwise, I don't think it matters that much. Um, if if there's something that's helpful, if it if it gives me what I need, if it's AI or not, I, I don't really care. I'll build on uh, <laughs> Linus's point very quickly yeah. and just say that like. You know, it, it really is the context, right? The content itself, the way the sausage is made, who cares? But there are reasons platforms will start caring about this too, right? Okay, let's let's yeah. actually go from the consumer from our standpoint and then the platform standpoint. For us, it's like if somebody's telling us something is true, we need to be able to tell like if it's actually true, right? We have that already. But now we need to be able to tell if the person telling us is actually a human, right? Because we might value a human's perspective on something more than, oh yeah, you should totally go to this restaurant. I absolutely love it. Look at this photo I took. And all of that could be totally like synthetic now, right? And we wouldn't even know. But on the platform side, it could be like the bot problem on Twitter on freaking steroids with like, I don't know, some like diesel thrown on top with a little bit of nuclear sprinkles. I don't know. It could just end really, really badly, right? So it gets I, messy. Uh, in a, it, 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 and I see Randy Zuckerberg listening, and she's uh, a really talented person who's been on Broadway in in Broadway plays. There's an off Broadway play called Sleep No More, where the play happens around you. 
the the performers are doing their lines all around you while you walk through a maze in a in a warehouse together. Um, and that's how the future is to me. It's all around me. I think and... it ultimately has to do with the experience that you want to create for your audience, right? It's like, so many of us on, in the space are creators or we're posting on social media and we're probably thinking, how does AI fit into my content creation workflow? And if people notice I'm using AI, how does that reflect on me? And I don't think it's like a, it's a black or white situation. I think there's a lot of gray area and it really comes down to like, is this content good or not? Is it informative? Is it interesting? Is it entertaining? Does it make me laugh? Is it beautiful? And, and there's, but there are qualities of AI content that are undesirable, that are harder to identify. Like, huh, there's something weird about this. I don't know why, but when I look at this picture, I can tell that this isn't a real human and that bothers me. And so if, if we think about AI detectors and, and the sort of whole, um, you know, the the ecosystem around that i'm less interested in it from the point of view of like no oh, we need to stop ai content i'm more interested in the sense of like hey maybe i use some ai here can you help me identify parts that might trigger people into thinking this is inauthentic or it's not real or it's not a good experience and maybe help me clean those up or you know in the case of writing like i'm going to make sure that i'm going to rewrite that or or edit it thoroughly in the case of an image i'm going to go through and regenerate that little spot where the clothing folds and has a shadow that just doesn't look quite right or something like that i think that like those are the things that i'm most interested in but like, like linus was saying um you know that that's assuming that everybody is is just out to do good things with this content. And when you can clone a grandmother's voice, or a, sorry, a daughter's voice and have her call the grandmother and ask to be wired some money for an emergency and like scam somebody using that voice. When you, when you can do all these things, and I mean, and that's the easy low hanging fruit one. There's so much like bad stuff that you could do with AI. Our family has a past phrase for that reason. So if somebody gets a call, at asking for money or help, getting somebody out of jail or something like that, we ask for the passphrase. Right, and I f actually fell for a scam last year. Like I couldn't believe it that it was a scam. It was so good. And I think that especially with open source models now having sort of parity with ChatGPT 3.5, we're gonna see an increase in sophistication in like phishing yes. campaigns and other types of cyber attacks. And it's like, imagine if you hacked somebody and you could act on their name, their job. They like what happened to me is they got my boss's name, and my boss contacted me and asked me to do something urgently while he was out of town to take care of something while he was at a conference. And like they knew all this stuff was happening, but it wasn't my boss who really needed this. It was somebody else. Like like it's super sophisticated. And with AI, you could take a very basic set of information and turn it into an extremely convincing you know, personal conversation between people or, or something like that. Like On the other hand, we have AI tools to watch for our phone calls and our messages to help us discern whether somebody is legit or not. Because there's usually signs if you look for them very closely, like at the email address it's coming from. If you stopped and look at that really closely, you'd probably see, oh, no, that's not my bank calling or sending a message, right? All right. Right. Um, it's it's those little details that AI can see at mass, right? As we head toward um, the two hour mark, I know Linus and um, Bill, but both our panelists who joined a little bit late today, weren't here at the beginning of the conversation. We were talking about some of the biggest things um, that happened, like the biggest moments in AI for this year or the biggest um, technologies, as well as like looking ahead to next year and making predictions. I wondered if you guys wanted to share like a moment or something that you're super excited about uh, in terms of what happened and then what's coming. Oh, yeah. Well, let's do it. I mean, uh, I'll keep it very brief. I would say I think obviously GPT-4 was absolutely phenomenal. I think the rise of like advanced perception capabilities, all the multimodal stuff, equally exciting. I think the waves in AI video generation, we all kind of moved on from, I guess, text to video is still kind of popular, but image to video became exceedingly exciting. Video to video is getting, you know, a bunch of, it started off as a fun thing with ControlNet and EvSynth, and we had Gen 1 for a while, then people kind of forgot about it for a little bit. 
And now we've got Pika with a video and painting again, kind of doing video to video. And then the last one for me is obviously like the 3D capture stuff, right? Like we started off the year, nerfs were still super hot. Nerfs kind of started popping off last year, ostensibly after instant NGP. And uh, yeah, now here we are like, you know, Gaussian splatting, the new way to create radiance fields popped onto the scene. And just very recently, we've seen some papers that are like, nah, nah, nah. Nerf ain't gone just yet. There's a bunch of cool stuff you can do with nerfs too. So I'm just loving that each of these modalities is getting more and more mature. And I'm excited to see how they sort of all come together next year. So that would be my very, very quick and brief uh, highlight reel. Well, can you tell us like just real fast, what was the big change for you in the past year? Like what really was a trajectory that, that changed the trajectory of how you were thinking and maybe got you to the point where you wanted, because you left your job um, to be a full-time creator. What was that in the spring? That's exactly right. Yeah, totally. At the end of March, I would say it's like the, the fact that we're going to get new capabilities every two to three months. And it just seems like clockwork that this is going to keep happening. And with all the modalities that I talked about, the fact that we can put them together to create content that required like a massive team, really solid engineering expertise, the fact that it's almost easier being outside of a large tech company to go and play with this stuff in a more unencumbered fashion is wild to me. And I think that's still the case. If you look at open source video generation, open source LLMs, all the cool stuff that's happening tends to find really interesting roots in open source. But then you can use them in concert with a bunch of sort of, you know, obviously the incumbents too, but also the new entrants as well. So I think like that's been super exciting for me. And I, and I expect that trajectory to continue. Uh, hopefully into next year as well. I'll just say too, I remember when you told me you were going to, you had a plan, a 30 day plan to be a full-time creator. And I kind of thought, oh yeah, right. But you did it. So <laughs> congratulations. And that's Thank something you. else. I can't believe that that happened. It seems like it was so long ago, but I remember but that. Eight months ago. Like, yeah. Totally. My goodness. How much has changed? <laughs> Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> thank you so much. And as Linus said, I was talking and then I'll hand it over to him. It's like, it's eight months, but it feels like it's been a freaking decade. So like, just imagine what next year is going to feel like. And the year after that, as we just climb up this curve, it's going to be, it's going to be wild. Yeah. Thanks for that. I think to the point where, you know, it feels like forever, um, November last year, I uh, was a normal dude. It's been on, on Twitter then, now X, for 16, 17 years, posting with my friends and, and having my little community of a few few thousand people, maybe two, 3,000 people. And um, I, I started using GPT 3.5 because a friend of mine had been building a, a piece of software for quite some time, and he, um, he managed to sell that piece of software. And he introduced me to the world of kind of like, uh, large language models in general, and and I, I just got my head split open basically every single day. I I I, um, I did not believe the things that I was seeing, and my instant reaction was like, if I don't share this with other people, and if other people do not get this knowledge as fast as I'm getting this knowledge, the information divide between the people that do understand this and the people that don't understand this will be so wide, and it will become too hard for people to cross the chasm uh, and and it's going to be my my only job from now on is going to be to talk about ai teach about ai and, and do whatever i can and um for some damn reason that that turned out to work quite well um I, i've had a fantastic year uh, i've been very appreciative of everyone that supported me uh and and the, the community journey and many people in this in this space and I become good friends and I spend pretty much all my Fridays uh, to my partner's demise um, doing this very late between 11 and, and usually 2 a.m. Um, and the biggest thing for me, except kind of the community and seeing everyone around just um, learning together and being very open and friendly compared to many other communities online, um, it's been, I think, the, the uh, release of GPT-4. So up until GPT-4, um, not much happened. Uh, I, I feel like there was a lot of kind of aha moments and everyone got along for the ride and then GPT-4 got released and, and things just kicked into a complete different gear. Um, I've obviously been very interested in, in the generative art space. Uh, I've been playing with Midjourney, like many people in here, for 
many, many hours and, and sharing all my findings early on and, and just trying to get people to understand that this is kind of the future of how we're going to generate things. Um, but, but apart from that, like GPT-4 was, was kind of the, the, the thing that just propelled everything forward for me. Uh, I do think that people have yet not understood the true implications of language models in general and where, where this type of technology will bring us and kind of the stepping stone that it is to other things. Um, I think maybe 2024 will kind of crystallize that out in a different way. And it, we're going from having these interfaces that are just, you know, chat interfaces that are bringing conversations and bringing us information and knowledge in a way that we're not used to, to become more kind of the glue uh, and maybe the fabrics of things that, you know, we, we, we're going to see tighter integration into existing software. We're going to see, see kind of maybe the inkling of the first operating system built uh, with an LLM, for example. So I'm extremely excited uh, about 2024 and I, I'm equally excited to bring more people into the fold and, and continue to to teach and and hopefully you know uh, get some people to open their eyes to this and, and be less afraid and and kind of embrace and understand that it's a tool to augment themselves and uh, if you're listening to this and if you listen to me throughout the year you you're you, you you'll be probably very attuned to this that I, I i i do this because i want to give back and i do this because i want to you know help as many people as possible so thank you for giving me the mic heather as, as always thank you for for allowing me to have a voice here and yeah thank you so much everyone for tuning in I'm th thank you for always for showing up um, on your own all this time, Linus. And it's such a, like you said, the way that we've all become friends and even everybody on the panel and the audience um, or in the people, the new people that join us, it's all been, you know, just organic. And I appreciate it. This community is amazing. And I think that like talking about um, giving back and trying to ever since last December, that was my main goal, like teaching people hey, use this while you have it. We've never had this kind of access to information before. You have the, you know, you can do whatever, but you have to take advantage of it before it's gone or before it's gated and things like that. But it, it's, it is really breaking down barriers and uh, empowering people if they choose to use it or if they understand how they can use it. And we all play a part in that. And I hope that like over the next year with all the different, features that we have here on X now with like live streaming and things like that, that we can find more, even more ways to be able to bring information to people, start, you know, doing demos and things like that. We can collaborate even on different days of the week and then this space to work on showing people how to do certain things, kind of like what Matt's doing on his show. And Matt, I did want to ask you because you've covered so many topics and so many tools do you what do you think like the biggest um like the biggest response has been to any particular tools or what, what did you notice trends on this year because you were kind of showing everybody how these things worked? I didn't watch your most recent show yet about the 28 free tools that we don't know about, but you really have dived into all these and just tried to do as many as you could so that we could see it. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm going purely off of like what videos get the most views and get the most sort of engagement, it's pretty much been anything open AI chat GPT related. That's, that's definitely been the, the biggest story of the year for, for the channel. Anytime I talk about the open AI updates or GPT four was huge. My most popular video this year did 1.2 million views. And that was uh, all about GPT Actually, it was before GPT-4, but it was all about chat GPT. So um, anything chat GPT was definitely the big story of the year from, from that perspective. Um, you know, but again, like, like I was talking about earlier on when uh, on this space, I think the really it's just been all about the pace. It's, it's been about the, the speed and the movement in the AI space this year. Um, the, the most popular videos I post on my channel are the Friday videos where I talk about all of the news that happened in the past week. And every single week, <laughs> almost, I feel like I start off the video with like, man, this week has been crazy. Like, look at everything that happened this week. But then I started to realize I'm saying that every single week. So I don't even say that anymore because that's just be kind of that's become like a meme, right? Like every week, the pace just sort of picked up steam. And whenever I thought we couldn't have a bigger week in AI and there couldn't be more momentum and there couldn't be like a bigger news story to come out in AI, you know, another week would top it. So um, really it's, it's just been all about the, the pace of things. And 
how quickly we've seen things evolve, things like the um, AI to uh, the text to video and text to 3D and text to image and all of these kinds of things. You look at it back in January and you look at it now and it it feels like years of evolution in 12 months. So, you know, that's that's really been the story of the channel, honestly. And that's 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 pretty cool. Thank you for confirming or just even letting us know, because, you know, a lot of us on here were thinking about visuals. But I guess for the majority of people, chat GPT would be more um, applicable in their lives and um, something that they would be able to use more than, you know, image generation and video or text to speech. Um, I wanted to bring up something I kept I keep forgetting to mention. One of the things with GPT four that I really enjoyed and what I noticed that can really help a lot of people, and I don't know if they realize it, is the note, the speech um, speech to text, or in especially with the GPT, apps like Oasis, and I don't know if Otter, if the, the apps that will take your, they'll transcribe your voice notes and they can create content from that. And that's pretty amazing to me because it's kind of like a blend between you um, just asking, prompting it to write something for you, or you just spilling out all the thoughts that are in your mind, and you can choose how to have that information. It'll transcribe it, summarize it, and then you can have it in a thread, in an email, in a text message, um, in a blog article, as a mind map. Um, a to-do list and those things. So I do that sometimes. And it's really wild how well it can fill in the gaps and create something out of your, your whatever you just say, oh yeah, by the way, I want to, I want to look at this tool and that tool and this tool. And it comes up with a whole article about that and it fills in the information or it'll give me a mind map so I can kind of, or, you know, go through and follow through with my to-do list. Um, those are the things that people that have, um, any kind of uh, disability or, you know, or they could have a uh, neurodivergent or uh, dyslexia. They could have uh, any type of thing where they, they don't have access to something where they can type it, right? That just opens up so much more for them and it gives them the same tools. I know you can do it also with chat GPT and perplexity, things like that, but these tools work specifically for that where it's just gonna transcribe it in different ways that you choose. But these are the kind of things that I'm really excited for for next year. I guess we can start closing it out. Um, and I wanted to tell everybody, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. And this will be our last space for this year. And we'll be back in January. And for January, since we know already there's probably going to be a thousand things that happen between now and January. Um, so we'll have part two of <laughs> the year in AI <laughs> and what we have, um, you know, the things that have affected us and what our predictions are to come and what we're looking forward to and how we're using it. I can't only imagine how many things will happen in the next two weeks if it's anything like last year um, and stays on this course. But I just wanted to give everybody a chance to say goodbye and um, you know, anything you want to plug real fast? Let me see. Allie, you want to go first? Uh, that was sudden. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. No, yeah, it's no, okay. It's okay. You, you know how we are all doing here, like something else in the side. I'm actually at the same time on mid journey. So uh, I guess my, um, final thoughts here are that I am really hoping we are going to get version six for mid journey during this break time because that would be fantastic instead of first of the year because it's going to be crazy scramble and so for those that may not know um they announced during the office hours that they are now at the stage where the next thing would be the uh, rating party meaning us we can rate images and this is kind of the last ish step before v6 would be released so Still hoping before Christmas, but, you know, and I'm really hoping, <laughs> keeping my fingers crossed. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, other than that, I will be just um, doing some organizational stuff during these last um, two weeks of this year so that I can really kick it in the gear starting 2024. Thank you for, for bringing up the mid-journey thing, because I, I've been meaning to ask. I hope they don't come up with it until I learn how to use the alpha um, site because I'm still a little bit lost in a couple of things that aren't there. But what happens when you're generating on that Midjourney Alpha site where I hear my Discord uh, notifications going off? 
where is that being generated on Discord? Could I find that within Discord? Like say I want to vary right now. I can't get it to do any of the very region or very strong or subtle. So how I can't, can't find it. Anybody know? Or yes, should I just open it up on the, I guess I could just use You that. need to open it up in Discord. That's the fastest way to do that. And basically what I would say is that don't worry if you're not very comfortable with the alpha site at this point. And so again, for others or people that may not know, so Midjourney released the image generation capability on the alpha.midjourney.com, but this is currently only available for those that have 10,000 or more images generated. However, they will be lowering the that soon where it's going to be 5,000 and 2,500 and so forth. They just are trying to control it so that uh, because they don't know what's going to break. And David said that things will look different. This is just like the first testing phase. So levers and things that you see there may not, and the whole thing may not even look like anything that it looks like right now. So um, I'm basically still doing most of my things on Discord. Um, there are things that I'm not super comfortable or I don't really like, I should say, honestly, <laughs> on the new alpha site. Like I want things to look a bit different or feel a bit different. So um, again, also it's, you know, I'm just getting used to it, but um, it can be definitely more streamlined and have a better uh, user experience. But there are some things that I absolutely love also. So we'll see where it ends up going. But um, yeah, so I would say basically like, don't don't sweat it at this point. <laughs> at least that's how I'm taking it. Yeah, no, I, that's a good point. And there, yeah, pe for people who don't have it, yeah, there's a lot of good things. And then there's also some things that are irritating, but it does seem like it has the potential to streamline a lot of steps you don't have to take anymore with upscaling anything. And it's just different. Even the describe, um, the way it works is, is kind of different where you have the keywords instead of the, like the tags and keywords come up instead of the actual prompts. So you can pick and choose from different categories and kind of create your own describe um, based on the things, the characteristics that you see in those keywords. And that's pretty interesting, but it'll take some time to learn how to use it and work with that. But um, Taylor, do you, can you speak right now? Um, if you want to say goodbye or Anything I know you yes, want. Yes, 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 yeah. absolutely. Amazing space as always. I'm, you know, these are just the places that I come to learn and be enmeshed in this community. Um, I'll be really brief and quick and just say, like, if you if you are a creator or or a solopreneur or a content entrepreneur or a founder, whatever it is that you're doing, you're creating content online, um, check out my Substack if you yeah. if you like that kind of stuff. I publish a newsletter once a week. I know. <laughs> and that is my cue. Um, but I appreciate you all. I love you so much. Have a happy new year, all of you, because that's when we will reconvene again. Yes, yes. And um, that was really sweet of him <laughs> to handle that that um, transition. I love it. Um, let me see. Salma, you want to go ahead? Sorry, I know I put everybody on the spot. <laughs> But Salma, can you can you talk? Salma. Okay, we'll go to Matt. We were talking to you. Linus, you okay, let me see. Uh, Rob. Salma's mic wasn't working, but she's oh, building oh. creates at um with a Q. Um so definitely check out her product photo AI tool, really cool. Um, and, and follow her for more on that. I, I love what she's up to. Um, as for me, if you hit my profile, if you if you like learning prompting, prompt engineering, um, you can find my membership there, Lenin Labs. Uh, that's where I put over $1,300 worth of AI courses at a, or for a super affordable subscription fee. So check that out. Um, I'm also secretly or not so secretly anymore working on an app version of my best-selling course content reactor which over 3,000 people have been through and basically taking all the ai content creation and ai ghostwriting workflows and making them that much more manageable the idea is to have the highest quality ai ghostwriting app out there in terms of just like really instead of um like i'm taking the opposite approach of, of a lot of the other AI, ai tools which is like 
they want you to generate content in one second with one click, and then it, it tends to be not so great and kind of disposable and not very interesting. I'm going the opposite route, all in on quality, all in on understanding your audience, what they really care about and delivering for them. So keep an eye out for that. Follow me if you want to get in on the alpha or the beta test. I'm gonna, gonna be rolling out some invites starting tomorrow. Wait, you said this will be for ghostwriting too, because that's taken quite a hit um, in the past several months. And that's actually, I was uh, working on a ghostwriting, you know, venture for a little while. That would be very big and very helpful. Right. You know, like, I, I think a lot of people want AI in their content process, but they, they're not quite sure how to do it without losing their authenticity or without lowering quality or without just looking like you're using AI. And, um, a lot of people have used the frameworks from my course to achieve these goals, but now we're trying to put it in an app to make it even more manageable because you're you're potentially generating hundreds of posts or articles. Um, it gets a little bit out of hand when you try and do it yourself. Well, and that'll be too, not just for the ghostwriting, but for everybody that write, creates content, you know, because of the importance of having, you know, decent writing to go along with whatever it is that you're writing about or whatever kind of type of content you're creating. So that'll be great. I can't wait to see that, uh, to have it in an app. Man, it's amazing how fast things move here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to leave because I'm sitting in my yes. in my trailer in my trailer in my garage or in my new studio. So may, may I just a short update from me? Um, as many as many as many know, I am building a few things. Uh, maybe the most interesting thing I'm building is super new. Uh, it's still not out there. It's still not uh, for you to 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 try. But essentially, super new is going to be a little place where builders or makers. Uh, can put their products and uh, find their first 1,000 uh, users. That's kind of the idea to to kind of connect potential users with uh, potential pieces of software um, in an authentic way and not so much in a um, hysteric marketing way. Um, so far, uh, progress have been good, um, and and I'm making strides to to get there, but I'm a bit delayed. Um, and if you want to follow all the AI stuff, I mean, I'm here on X. Um, just click my name, click the follow button, and, and join in on the little squad. Uh, I also have a little community here that's more focused on AGI. And uh, lastly, I write a weekly newsletter that's free on Substack, uh, and you can find it at insidemyhead.ai. And that's inside my head dot AI. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everything. Thank you so much again for having me. And I, I'm going to leave uh, you now. But, well, thank yeah. you. Have a good weekend, Linus. And thank you for um, reminding us of those things. And it's amazing what you're doing with that, with the studio itself, but um, also for your efforts to try to connect builders with users and even, you know, if they need influencers um, to help them test these things too. Um, thank you so much for, you know, trying to stick up for people and, and to find ways to uh, put them together. Yeah, with, thank with you. Them. I thank think you. we have we have that like we have almost a, it's almost on us now to, f to figure this out, to help people. There are so many great builders out there that are putting their, you know, their sweat equity and their lives in on hold to build amazing software. And then they release it and they are met with crickets because unfortunately they don't have the distribution or the eyes or the the means to figure out where to find them so i think like it's it's very clear now within being in my position that if i for good and for for bad if i if i talk about something um i do be i do have the ability to generate a fair bit of buzz and i think that same goes for people like matt with his youtube channel obviously if he says something uh, people will go and try things out, and I think it's just it's fair that we're trying to use this um, to to do do good and and to help people that really needs help. And I don't think about a better way than to to make a platform that that has this as a core mission to kind of help connect makers and potential you know people that benefits from what the people are making. That's so. It's thank you so much for that. It's so important, and people don't realize how hard it is to find the people that you need to um, talk to, who you need to get those messages to, and who need the people that actually need the product um, in order to help you work out those bugs. Thank you so much for that. And um, Matt, I did we do, yeah, you want to talk about what you're doing? Um, sure, yeah. So going for the last couple weeks? Yeah, I mean, my my main focus pretty much all year and and will continue to be is, is the YouTube channel that I've been working on. Um, you know, my, my goal is just to kind of 
show off the cool tools, show off the stuff that's flying under the radar, you know, share the news that's that's hot and uh, just kind of keep my finger on the pulse of the latest news and tools. And between the, the YouTube channel, just, you know, go to YouTube and search out Matt Wolf, you'll find me and uh, my website, Future Tools, where I, you know, keep track of the tools and the news. That's that was pretty much my game plan for 2023 and will continue to be my game plan for for 2024 is just to stay on top of it and kind of continue to to share the good word. Well, it's been amazing legend. to ride with you. Oh, go ahead, Linus. I just want to say legend. I mean, so so <laughs> many good things this year because of you, Matt. So keep up keep up what you're doing and keep keep just giving. Appreciate it, Linus. Mutual respect here. And Rob, did you 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 just did yours? I got everybody. Scovels, what's up? Since I'm looking, we're, I'm sitting here looking at something. Bilal will put in our group chat and the DMs, and it's from February 24th, and it's a screenshot of the space. And the top row is me, Taylor, Bilal, Robert, and then Matt and Linus are there. Um, we have Midas from um, uh, Leonardo at the time that was there, and Stoke Builder. Drayson, you know, from Kyber, all these different things. Um, and it's AP. like, you, yeah, yeah, AP, that's right. He has, a, he looks totally different too. Like the same, um, Vicky J down there. Um, we just, N Natalia, Carvin, there's so many cool, it's all these different people that have been with us for so many months and we've been doing this for a while. So um, it's just so much has happened, but Scoble, what do you want to leave us with tonight? Next year, uh, Apple's Vision Pro is coming. I think that's going to be more important to this community long term. Maybe not next year because they can't sell enough of them, but that family of product is going to bear fruit, you know, over the next five years. It's going to be something. Um, it's just, I can't wait. I think that it'll be sooner, I hope, than we thought. But um, it's just so. Well, I've been waiting 13 years for this thing, so <laughs> it's been a while. Ready. Yeah, it seemed like it was forever ago that we were having the, the watch parties and stuff like that for the, the um, <laughs> you know, the announcements. But thank you for you know helping to. It keep... will bring multi-party experiences with if you had four of them in your house, or if you had two friends who had them and two people in your house, you could play a new kind of multi-party concert experience or video game coming next year. So it, it'll be a fun year. Do you think, I wonder, since we have like all the different open source things and um, just so much innovation that maybe there will be not necessarily competition, but it'll be expanded further than it won't be as out of reach for as many people. Eventually, uh, the people who make the glasses, the lenses keep coming to my house and showing them to me over years. And they they know that eventually it's cheaper to make a pair of augmented reality glasses than to make your phone. But hmm. they need to get the R&D paid back. Uh -huh. Apple alone has spent $40 billion. Mark, Mark Zuckerberg has spent somewhere in that neighborhood as well. So maybe there will be cheaper alternatives, and then eventually it will get where it's kind of evening out after some time. It, it, the bleeding edge is always expensive. But, you know, a, a printer in 1989 cost $45,000 to run to do color printing. Yeah. Um, today, a $70 printer is way, way, way better. Yeah, that's a good point. It's even right, gone down so. significantly um, in the past 10 years, really. So, hmm. The glasses are coming. They're a little bit later than I expected. I thought they would be here by now. But, you know, that's what happens. Things slip. Maybe they'll arrive with in combination with something else that we didn't expect. So, uh, <laughs> With Apple, you can see this stuff coming years in advance now because they have to plan out their products at such deep level to get the supply chains built because it's such a massive company now. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, thank you for, thank you for um, all your insight over this past year. Thank you. Um, I Just feel so much smarter. A new book on Metaverse 2.0 and it's getting good reviews. So going oh, into cool. Christmas feeling good. Yeah. And thanks for what you do for the community. It's uh, always oh, the best show. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I and got I, a lot it, of shows. <laughs> 
Thank you. And I wanted to say to all your lists, too, that are uh, pretty valuable to kind of if you all need to do any research or look up anybody. Um, he has you want to find some AI artists. I got a list of twenty four hundred AI artists. Now. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> no, it's a crazy so list, many. man. You There's put so that on three deck on your screen on Friday night. It goes fast. <laughs> People yeah, post true. a lot of art. <laughs> it's like you, the AI art community is going nuts. It's funny how much that has changed too. Like how the way we post things and um, it's kind of different now. But it's it's interesting. But that is true. Yeah, it would probably take most of the day if you just had the um that list going on your um X Pro. But um, thank you for having it because it's hard to find everybody there. And if you get your list in order, you can just use that one in the meantime. It might be a little, might be overwhelming though. But I do want to thank everybody. Tweet deck. Get tweet deck. Tweet deck is magic with AI art because it go it refreshes automatically, so you don't have to. A new item gets posted by Heather. You see it <laughs> at the top of the column. It's awesome. It's oh, it's so it could be a little bit too much stimulation. Sometimes. Oh, it can. <laughs> yeah, because I I have to kind of like close that window because um it's too much for me because I keep seeing stuff popping up. But um I do like it. I'm trying to learn how to get used to it and not just kind of roll through notifications backwards. That's what I normally do. But um. I want to thank everybody. I'll let everybody go. It's almost 730. And thank you all very much for coming and joining us today. And all that you've all come here, you know, week after week. And I see a lot of friends here that, um, I mean, I could just keep going on. Steven, Nicholas, Nicholas, congratulations with Runway. Um, Cameron and all, uh, Sarah, we got Alexander, Dave, just going through, um, Yvonne, Dothan, people who've just been coming week after week. Thank you all so much. Look around at the people that are in the space right now and see like there's so much amazing work that they're doing, whether it's building or art, design, writing, just check it out and see music, um, just the building, just so much in innovation that's happening there. Pharma Psychotic, I see you down there. Crystal, Keith, everybody, Chrissy, I just have so many people. Thank you so much. Fletchy, Tony, appreciate it. Um, follow these people to see what they're about. B, I wanted to say hello. What's up? I'm sorry that I haven't been going through and um, if people who were requesting the mic, I apologize that we didn't take the mics today because we knew we had so many people. We didn't want to kind of um, get too far off, but thank you for showing up and being willing to join the conversation. Um, I have all, you know, I'm doing the same thing basically as everybody else, continuing to write and try to educate people about AI and how to use different tools. I like to find ways to use complicated tools for people who don't have backgrounds in art and design and things like that so that I can teach you how to do it too and try to simplify it and see how you can use that in your lives. But that's what I do. I have my weekly newsletter, um, Visually AI, and I appreciate all the subscribers that I have. And I offer a variety of different things within that. I do a lot of tutorials and tips and techniques and tool lists. So it's a little bit different. I don't do as much news. Just try to give you some information and use cases that you can use. I'm working on my YouTube channel to have that going very soon so that I can show people my screenshots or, or just kind of, you can watch what I'm doing. So all these types of things, it's always something to do. And um, I appreciate the support from the community and that there are so many people in the room um, and I'm just flattered and honored that people would spend want, want to spend time here with us. So thank you. Please have a great weekend and a good holiday. And we'll see you in January, first week of January. Thank you so much. Thank you for hanging around okay. a little bit longer, Linus. <laughs> Be careful. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night, everybody.